Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. John DeLynn. It is November 13th, 2021, and we are so excited uh, this weekend for Thrive, Thrive Beyond Mormonism, this amazing conference. We are a few tickets away from being sold out at 1,400 people. It'll be the second largest post-Mormon event in the history of the world. Uh, and given that it's kind of during a time of COVID, we're super happy about that. Um, we are, uh, even more excited if you can believe it or not to have with us in studio today, um, Sarah Edmondson and Nippy Ames. How are you guys doing? Good. Great. Welcome guys. Thanks, Thanks for having you. us. Thank you for having us. So I'm sure most of you know who these amazing people are. Um, but, uh, for those of you who don't, once upon a time, there was a, um, uh, we could just call it kind of a sex cult started in upstate New York by uh, a man named Keith Raniere, and the cult was called Nexium. And uh, Sarah and Nippy are survivors of that cult, and you can see all about their story on a currently released multi-series, nine-hour epic documentary on HBO called The Vow. Margie and I just finished The Vow this week. Um, you can also hear about Sarah's story specifically in her book called Scarred, um, which I have begun to read, but I have a long way to go, but I'm super excited to read this book. Make sure and buy and read this book. And also you can follow Sarah and Nippy on an amazing podcast that they're in their second season of mm -hmm. called A Little Bit Culty. And so we, when we learned about Sarah Nippy and all the amazing things they did and do and have done, and honestly, they, along with just a few other people, are uh, responsible for bringing down Keith Raniere and uh, his cult, and he is now in federal prison for like 120, 150 years. We'll talk about that. They were key uh, figures in bringing this cult down, a lot like Leah Remini and Mike Rinder were for Scientology and others. So these are, in my world, these guys are heroes. And we brought them to Thrive this weekend to help keynote. Now this, this episode is going to air after Thrive's over um, because we've already sold out. We don't need more promo and we want to be able to take breaks. But I am so super excited to have you guys in studio all the way from Vancouver, Canada. So Sarah Nippy, thanks for joining us. Thank you for Thank having you. us. We're excited. Anything you guys want to fix or correct or add to the introduction? Oh, bang on. I thought you did a great job. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, um, we're also really thrilled to have in studio uh, my my beloved co-host, uh, Kara Burrell. Of hey. Kara, it's good to have you. It's so good to be here. You had a great tour around Temple Score yesterday <laughs> with uh, Sarah and Nippy and some other people. So and Anthony and, and Anthony, Anthony Magnabosco, Magna right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm really fun. excited to get into this. So thanks for coming out, guys. Thank you. Yeah. So I uh, I one of the th so so first of all we have a couple hours uh, because this weekend is going to be really full. So this is unlike many Mormon Stories episodes. This is not going to be a, a 15 hour or even an eight hour interview. We're going to spend a couple hours uh, with Sarah Nippy today. We're really honored to have that much time. Um, and uh, I thought a lot about it. Like we don't want, you know, we don't want to try and recreate this amazing book or recreate uh, the, this epic nine hour series on the vow or even their podcast. We want you to go watch all of that. And so all of that's going to be in our show notes. So I thought about um, what, what could we do to make the most of our time today? And what I thought would be really interesting would be to have them tell enough of their story in a emotional, personal way for you guys to just learn how epic and gripping it is. Because in some ways he takes, Keith Raniere takes Colts to a level we haven't seen before um, in, in many ways. And in some ways it's kind of the same old, same old uh, kind of cult forming uh, sex cult forming. But if any of you remember my interviews with like Chris Shelton or Lloyd Evans with Scientology, Scientology or, or the Jehovah's witnesses, what so many of my listeners have valued is kind of seeing a little bit about the parallels between any, any high demand religion and or cult and kind of the history of, of Joseph Smith and Mormonism. 
And so what I did, what I did to begin is I kind of pulled together my best description of uh, Keith Raniere and Nexium. And I want my listeners to begin by kind of just listening to this description. And I'm not trying to poison the well, but I just want to know if this sounds familiar because I read this to Sarah Nippy right before. And I just checked to see if if this sounded familiar to them. They endorsed it. And, and you listeners, you just tell me if, if this sounds familiar. So here goes my summary of Keith Raniere, uh, founder of Nexium. Man from upstate New York gets involved in fraud um, in the early part of his life. Everything falls apart and his um, early efforts are um, exposed as fraudulent, mostly commercial. Even though those early efforts fall apart, he realizes that he has the power to influence people and gains a small following and a reputation of being special, kind of having special powers. So he reinvents himself as more of a spiritual leader, writes a bunch of new stuff, um, and creates an organization that's mostly focused around self-improvement and living your best life and being truly happy. Um, he claims to be special, and his followers start viewing him as special and having special powers and, and that he has the keys to happiness. So he acquires these followers and he sends them out all throughout the world to spread teachings. And um, he uses he relies a lot on the help of volunteers. Um, these people in the inner circle, some early people uh, start to defect. And when they defect, they are harassed um, and, uh, defamed in, you know, the media and in their social circles. Over time, the founder starts to implement multiple levels, um, in his organization, kind of multiple levels of advancement. And he even creates a secret society within the organization that's unbeknownst to the rest of the members of the group. Um, in this group, throughout the time, he is practicing, you can call it ethical non-monogamy, you can call it polyamory, you can call it polygamy, whatever you want, but the leader has lots of female sexual partners um, throughout the history of this organization. Um, and he even is involved with underaged women, uh, some as young as 14 years old, so he has a penchant for younger women, and um, he even uses women to recruit for additional female sexual partners. Um, over time, more he gets more and more powerful, more and more popular, um, and more and more people start defecting and they start to whistleblow. At some point, this reaches the press. Some very few but courageous whistleblowers are willing to go public, even at the expense of being punished um, and defamed and even... Uh, uh, yeah, just punished in very significant ways. Um, and those defectors are attacked and smeared. Miraculously, eventually, law enforcement gets involved, and eventually this leader is put in prison. Um, and even though he's put in prison and his movement is kind of put on hold, many of the women that he had sexual relations with continue to support and testify on his behalf, believe in him and defend him, and to this day, he continues to have followers who believe in him, even though his movement ended with him being imprisoned. Now, tell me, guys, is that an accurate description of kind of at least? Yep. Is it? Am I cherry picking? That's, 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 I mean, those are the broad strokes. <laughs> yeah. 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 For sure. And it's probably a little more abusive and worse than than that at, at certain. Yeah. In terms times. of the emotional yeah. manipulation. Well, I don't. I, I, I usually don't take that long to kind of preamble, <laughs> but but it's it's really stark to me, including the upstate New York. So, welcome to Mormon Stories podcast, guys. I'm Thank so excited you. to hear your story. Thank you. Thank you. So, if it's all right, let's begin with uh, just a little bit of your backgrounds before you ever join Nexium, just to kind of because because one of the big questions is how do people get caught up in these high demand religions or cults. And, and one of the things that I was struck by in the vow is it's not always poor, uneducated, um, kind of low IQ people. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's the best and the brightest. So, uh, let's start, let's start with you, Sarah. Okay. Let's a, a bit about your background. Sure. Some of this may be uh, repetitive in, in my, in my talk tomorrow at Thrive, but. No, that's okay. Cause this comes separate. out after. Yeah. Okay. So I'm from Canada. I'm the child of two 
kind of left wing, politically, socially active ex hippie therapist. And I born and raised there. I was always very, um, I was very much encouraged to make a difference in the world, <sighs> you know, leave the world a better, bless you, leave the world a better place type of thing. And uh, at the same time, you know, not to be like, you know, dime store psychology, as if he says, but I, <laughs> you know, I struggled with fitting in, in, in school. I was, you know, a bit of a dork and, um, went to summer camp and like found a little bit of more security there, but I was always kind of trying to find my, my place in the world. And, uh, in my twenties, I was an aspiring actress, sort of the stereotypical cliche of living in a basement suite and auditioning and looking for meaning and purpose and community. And I met a filmmaker whose work I really admired. And he said, well, if you liked my film, you may like this workshop that I just took. And I didn't research. I didn't ask anyone if they liked the course. I just trusted him and liked him. So I, I jumped into a training that happened to be happening in Vancouver, first Canadian one <clears throat> ever, uh, a couple weeks later. And that first training was really, it was a mixture of like, kind of bizarre rituals, but also helpful tools for life. And I overall felt, I felt uncomfortable after the first day. So I Googled it for the first time. And, and there was a lot of really nasty things that were said about the organization. So I called Mark, the director who'd recruited me. And he said, do you believe everything you read online? <laughs> and just cause it's there doesn't mean it's true. Why don't you trust your own experience? Wait till day three. And I did. And I overrode my gut instinct to get the F out because I couldn't get my money back also was part of it. And I trusted Mark. And yeah. this is Mark from What the Bleep Do You Know? Yes. Is that right? He's the Which filmmaker. is a movie that I like thought was really interesting. It was kind of a, was it a precursor to The Secret? Yes, it was before The Secret, but it was the first of, of many films that were sort of br bridging the, the gap between personal spiritual development and media and making those things more accessible to people. And I saw that film and I loved it. So when he, this person I really liked and respected, said you should do this, I was like, of course, which is how I now know how these things work. It's all leveraged trust, right? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So there are so many people leaving organized religion right now and they're leaving Mormonism. And so many of us think, well, now, you know, I, I, I value science, I value education, I value logic and critical thinking. And so I'm going to be secular. I'm going to leave a, a religion that maybe is based on magical thinking and superstition. And I'm going to be these progressive hippie kind of parents where I'm going to raise my kids to be free thinkers and, and to love truth and to do good in the world. And that's going to, and I'm going to save them from this high demand magical thinking based organization. That's kind of abusive. Yeah. And that almost sounds like your parents. And what I've noticed for many of the people that convert to Mormonism is they were raised by secular parents mm. who were free thinkers and wise and thoughtful. So I'm, I, I don't know if you've thought a lot about this. I'm sure you have, have, but like, why wasn't, what was it that your parents or your upbringing mm -hmm. couldn't give you that made you curious that, that, that didn't yeah. leave you feeling whole like you needed something else. Does that make sense? Yes, and I, I have to say, I totally don't blame my parents for no. any of this. Um, they did a great job raising me. I think partly it was that they split up when I was quite young. Divorce? Yeah, when I was two. So I think for me, I was always looking for wholeness and togetherness anyway, you know, and feeling like this, I had anxiety from a really young age. Um, but also, you're right, They, you know, my dad really rebelled from an extreme Anglican um, upbringing, his dad was a minister. And so he was very much like against all of that. So he and my mom really wanted me to find my own way and figure out what was right for me and not force any religion down my throat. But I did crave structure and a path. I didn't have like a way to get to where <clears throat> I wanted to get to. So it wasn't, I didn't think I was joining a religion. I thought I was joining a community of people who were interested in personal and professional mm -hmm. development. And it was a structure. And it was measurable, which I really liked. And that was, I think, almost in, in direct contrast to me being an actor, which is super not measurable. You can do all the things. You can look great. You can be fit. You can be a good actor and still not get the part, you know, as it were. So I found a structure in Nexium that said if you do X, Y, and Z, then you get promoted and you go up this ladder that promised future enlightenment, measurable growth, and all those things. So I think it was a combination of, you know, having a 
crappy career as an actor, which is not fulfilling. It's a hard career. It's a really hard career. Even if you're great. Even if you're great. Yeah. I, honestly, every I want to quit. Like every, I still, I'm still doing it. I'm like, I should quit. This is ridiculous. But I, I still do it. <laughs> um, you know, and then my parents, who gave me a sort of a smorgasbord of different religious things to try for myself, but without a lot of structure. And then my own internal needing to fit in and belong. And I, I thought that I'd found my tribe in Nexium. Yeah. One of the most powerful parts of, of The Vow is episode eight where Mark says nobody joins a cult, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, they join, mm-hmm. a good, they join a good thing. They don't join a cult. <clears throat> yeah, they yeah. join a good thing. And it's just that the good things got, got stuff going on behind the scenes that nobody can see. And maybe people aren't trained to be able to sniff out kind mm-hmm. of the, the warning signs of an unhealthy or a high demand organization. Is that fair to say? The abuses. Yeah. 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 Right. I know now, like if I, if I knew what I know now about cults and high demand groups, I probably wouldn't have even gone to the training in the first place because right. I would have felt the pressure that I had been given 48 hours to get the 20% discount. Right. And the I would have been demand, like, high pressure, high pressure. But I'm like, no, you know what? When is, if it's right, it'll be there when I'm ready. Or if I missed that red flag, as soon as I got there day one, when they asked us to call him Vanguard, somebody I'd never oh, met before, yes, he's called him Vanguard. you know, putting on sashes and all these things that were very weird and did trigger red flags in me. But again, I had Mark in my ear saying, just wait till day three, wait till day three. By day three, I had had enough shifts. And now I know you can indoctrinate someone into a new belief system in three days. Yeah. Cause I've been to like landmark forum and yeah. other things. It's basically all just warmed over secular Buddhism. Yep. And anyone can get, get you to have a shift if, if they captivate you right. for a long enough period of time. And you're open and attentive. And you're willing, which is yeah. you go there willing. Yeah. You have, and, and also for people who like <clears throat> are going there on their own accord, not dragged by their spouse or like their boss or something, yeah. they want to get their money's worth. Yeah. You know, they want to get something out of it. There's that, um, there's that uh, sunk cost fallacy where yes, the more yeah. time you spend in the car dealership, yeah. the more you're likely to buy a car because you're like, well, I've spent this time. I may as well get something out of it. Yes. So that's why the three day thing, it kind of encourages that sunk cost <clears throat> fallacy. And also yeah. there's a the term, the demand expectation that if you, if you you're expecting and you want to, and you haven't, so it's like those two things combined really encourage people to have shifts. Yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't so much you had any defective upbringing. No, no. divorce happens. I, yeah. I come from a divorce family. Um, so it's not your parents, but I, I do sometimes feel like, Frauds emerge to fool people, but we also humans have this incessant longing to fill the empty holes, to improve, to find meaning and purpose yeah. and joy. And sometimes we create these charlatans as much as they rise up to fool us, right? A, a good metaphor is a magic show. You go to a magic show, yeah, wanting to see magic, right? Yeah, right. So, um, because otherwise life can be meaningless and drab and painful. And you know there's a trick to it, but you also are like, I want to see this. I like the payoff. I like the emotional payoff that it yeah. gives me. So yeah. I don't know if that makes that much sense, but it kind sure. of feels like there's a pro- there, you want yeah. to see this work. Yeah, we that want magic sense. in the world yeah. somehow. So Nippy, let's let's back up and do you. Tell us a little bit okay. about your story prior to... I, and who joined Nexium first? Actually, I did. Okay. Um, and let's I think be- my story is... is, is what I think makes our stories together in tandem good is because mine's drastically different um, in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. I had, so I went to boarding school in Connecticut and I had a girlfriend that I went um, to boarding school who was actually from the Albany, New York area. Uh, we dated, we broke up. I still kind of had a thing for her for a while. I never really got over her. And, you know, I knew her family since I was 15 years old. Um, and I run into her in New York City. Can I can I ask you a question about boarding sure. school? I've got, only got the stereotypes in my mind of like, uh, good is it Goodwill Hunt? No, of uh, of the Robin Williams Dead Poet Dead Society. Poet Society. Yeah. It's like wealthy parents who don't really. And please forgive the stereotype. I do this sometimes on Mormon stories, but There's I plenty I like to be honest about like <clears throat> impressions. It's like rich parents yeah, yeah. that are so self involved that they don't really want to raise their kids, and they want to give their kids elite. Yeah, education. So they ship them off and that way they get a great education and the parents can kind of like do it's whatever they really want to be. Not doing. at all like that. My parents were very involved in my life, very involved in my education. My dad flew up from Atlanta to go to every one of my football games. Oh, know? wow. So that's, that's my over parents. the top. Yeah. yeah. So they were 
Well, they came right. from money. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I, I, okay, I but come, there was wealth. Yeah, just wealth. Um, but you felt and, loved and supported. Yeah, there was none of that. In fact, when I went to boarding school, I felt, because I'm, I'm one of five, four boys and a little girl. So I was very, we were very on top of each other. When I got there, it was hard being away at first, but I also felt like I can spread my wings. And I, the boarding school that I went to is called Hotchkiss. And to me, it was amazing. It's yeah. an amazing experience. Um, was, did you have a religious upbringing at all? Not at all. Secular, totally secular. Yeah, you know, my celebrated actually, Christmas. We saw, yeah, my, you know, my we talked about it. My dad yeah. grew up a li kind of Mormon, but mm. not really. Which is yeah. a fun little interesting yeah. Mormon yeah. connection. There's um, he's connection. born in Ogden, Utah, yeah. not far from here. Yeah. Um, and I don't even know what my mom was raised. So it, there was no real religious background at all. Um, so <clears throat> I run into my old girlfriend after college um, in New York City. And she, I think, had just taken a training or was going to take the training that she was telling me about. And I didn't really know much about it. She said her mom gave it to her as a gift because I think she was getting divorced or ha had some, you know, was in a vulnerable place in her life and it could help her. I was like, good for you. She gets out of the training and she tells me about it. And I was like, cool. And you're what age? I'm 26, 27. Post-college? Yeah. Did you yeah. start a career yet? Or? Yeah, I was auditioning in New York. I was working here and there. But like similar like to grind, you know, you, you know, and there's no real way to gauge where you are. But acting. But yeah, I was doing the hustle. Doing the hustle. Yeah, doing print work, commercial work, and stuff like that. So. And you had been a, like a quarterback at Brown Ivy University. League, at yeah. Brown, so right? I went to Brown That's kind of cool. Yeah. Ivy League quarterback. That's yeah. no small deal. It was fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, Silver lining. And so um, it's about a year and a half. And every time she comes to New York, she mentions it to me. And I'm like, mm, cool, not for me, not for me. <laughs> and I even said to her, I'm not doing your cult. Wow. Like flat out. Wow. Um, and I had a situation where I had just finished a, a, a independent film. She calls me on the phone, and every time I did like a job that I got paid for a little bit, I would go somewhere, see a friend from college, like you know, somewhere warm, and kind of reward myself or whatever. And she's like, "Well, instead of doing that, why don't you invest in your growth?" And I kind of was like, "She got me. She you know she knew my values and like just a little backstory. Like when we dated, I had books on John Kennedy." Troy Aikman, all the people that I looked up to. I even had Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. I had, I was interested in that. So she knew that about self improvement. Me. Yeah, she knew that about me. Well, I wanted to be the best at what I was doing in any endeavor, and she knew that about me. And she's like, "What if this could help you with that?" And the money I was going to use, I was going to use kind of like for fun. And I decided to invest in my growth, yeah. as they put it. Yeah. Right? And I went there, and for the first two days, my arms were folded. I was this guy. I was like, all right, Vanguard, sashes, bowing. Come on, <laughs> seriously? And about day three, I had a module called Blame and Responsibility that was really, really powerful for me. And it was just really the questions they were asking. I didn't feel like I was being forced anything. So the way to get someone whose arms is folded is you just don't force them. Yeah. Right? Because I was kind of expecting yep, that. Yep, right? Yep. Um, Let them. It, let yeah. them come to you with yeah. the energy. Yeah. And, they, and of course they did. And I'm sure they've seen people with their arms folded before. And to backstory, one of the things that got me in is because I've known her family for so long, she told me that her parents did it. And I really respected her father. Her father's a brain surgeon in the area. He played football and hockey at Yale. So I kind of felt like here's a guy who has my profile somewhat similarly, you know, and older than me <clears throat> advocating it. Yeah. You know, it had a testimonial supporting it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how bad could it be? So I went in kind of what we we're talking about with the confirmation bias of, you know, in day three, I was kind of like, okay, this is good stuff. And so I'm involved for probably about a year, year and a half coaching. I don't want to move to Albany. And Albany at the time was the only place you could take the, the training. And there was a group of people from, from New York City who would go up and try and bring it to New York. And I was part of that group. Like missionaries. Right. And we, we, we started running classes in New York. And after about a year and a half of doing that, I kind of looked around, took inventory and go, this, is, this isn't working. It doesn't have the right people. It doesn't have people with credibility. 
for lack of a better way of putting it, I felt like there was a lot of losers in there. And I, you know, I know that's not a very nice thing to say, but that's how movements start. They felt like losers. You get who you can get. Yeah. And I just didn't, there wasn't, it wasn't my tribe at all. So I respectfully, and I wasn't, you know, it wasn't confrontational. I was like, look, I'm, I'm out. And for about two, three years, I would keep in touch with Lauren Salzman, who was the daughter of the president of the company and Nancy. Yeah. Nancy Salzman and my old girlfriend who was in and out of it at the time. Um, and I just was like, good for you. Glad you guys are out there. It's good to know that's out there. And I went back to pursue my career. I got cast in something in LA. And what I do is I just kept inventory on goals that I have. And I decided like every now and then if there's a training, I'll take one, but I'm not the guy that's going to spearhead this brigade. It was my joke. It's not my, it's not my thing. So I took a training again, probably in early 2006 and the organization was considerably different. It had matured. Yeah. Yeah. It was three. It had entrepreneurs. It had filmmakers. It had grown to Mexico City, Monterey. It was growing. And I was kind of eating my humble pie a little bit. I was wrong. Yeah. This thing was catching on. And uh, I was still living in LA at the time. I go back to LA in about August or September of 2006. Mark Vicente, who I kind of hit it off in a training with earlier in the year, comes out to LA and says, listen, we have a film project we're working on. Um, Keith thought of you for this role. Ooh. Well, that didn't the have, lead, the lead. I, it didn't have ooh to me. I was like, okay, great. Hmm. You know, cause I was still, yeah. I had my myopia on my, what I wanted to achieve. Yeah. Right. Um, and I was like, okay. So he's like, well, you would have to come back to New York. I was like, great. You guys going to move me there. Hmm. And sure enough, about, Three weeks later, <clears throat> they pay for my move. They move my car. They put me up. All the things that look like are precursors to a film that's going to happen start to happen. Yeah. And I didn't have any reason to think that it wasn't. And by this time, the Bronfins were involved. The heirs Sa- to the yeah, Seagram. heirs to the Seagrams. Sara and Claire Bronfin were involved. Yeah. I moved to New York. Billionaires, right? Billionaires. Yeah. yeah. And I moved to New York. They have a room for me there. Um, and upstate. then Upstate New York. And um, in October of 2006, I get on a helicopter in Albany, New York. We fly down the Hudson with Mark and Claire Bronfman. We land. We go to Bergdorf Goodman. I get fitted for suits. I get fitted for all these things, which is wardrobe. for, And I don't have any reason to think this isn't happening. Then Mark has another project that Keith wants him to put him on. All these obstacles start to appear. And it's about May 2007. I'm pissed off. Cause that's six months of my life where, you know, where I had inertia in another area of my life, I gave up because this felt like it was in alignment with it mm-hmm. and it's not happening. Yeah. And I'm pissed. Yeah. You know, I'm in upstate New York spinning my wheels in a place that, you know, it's a one horse town. Yeah. It doesn't have like, there's, there's not an economy. Hey, there's not other buddy. places. It's not other places for me to right. exhaust, you know, things that I want to pursue. So now I start doing the back to New York thing. Cause I still think the project's going to happen and cut to, about fall of or early 2008, 2009, Sara wants to start a city in New York City and have an actual a center, center like, there. Like a center. And I said, like, okay, so I'm going to move back to New York. This can be an arena where I pursue one of the career paths of teaching the class because I still like the curriculum. And I can audition again. And I can be involved with. So my indoctrination was different than. It was a long. It was a, a long longer play. thing. Was a long but play. I always felt like because I was in a tribe of actors, directors, and the personal growth aspect, I had two things that kind of filled my cup, yeah. if that makes sense. Um, I had set my boundaries with the organization early on differently than most people. Also, I wasn't targeted. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of like, okay, we have, you know, what I look like now is maybe a guy who can give us a little credibility Yeah, <clears throat> selling this. And I was the only kind of alpha male around there. So yeah, you need was, that. Yeah, you need but, that. But you also need money yeah. and power and influence. Yeah. And you need foot soldiers. Yep. So yeah, you kind of, I bet you could probably target people. Well, and super loyal people that are loyal beyond everything. So you can probably put certain people in buckets of like, which were they? Right. Did they bring the money? Did they, were they super loyal followers? Did they have power and influence to persuade others? Or were they women who were targets of sex? Like those are, but let me, let me go ahead now. Let's pause your story for just a second. 
And let's tell a bit of Keith Ranieri's story because here's where I want to start trying to just make sure and highlight a few of the parallels. So let's go back and and you guys, if you want to tag team or whatever, tell us how Keith starts bef- long before Nexium. Mm-hmm. How does he begin his life slash career? What do we know? Do we know yeah. anything yeah, about his childhood? Yes. We know a little bit. There's actually a book called Don't Call It a Cult by Sarah Berman. Don't Call It a Cult. Put that in the show notes. Okay. If somebody wants like a really good overview from a journalistic perspective, it's I think it's the best book out there. Um, not written from a survivor's point of view, but just like this happened and then this happened. Investigative journalism. Yeah, investigative journalism. <clears throat> she's on one of, Keith. Yeah, on okay. Keith. She, she's one of the people that I went to, um, at one of the big interviews I did after the New York Times and uh, with Vice. And she, she was a former journalist at Vice and she writes a lot of great articles. Vice is, can be great, yeah. I think, yeah. So what we know about his upbringing, and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to be careful what I say because I'm not, I'm, it's not my total ex- area of expertise, but... One we know is that his uh, his dad was a madman. Uh, what's the way they call it? Adman on um, like a mat like in advertising. He, he in okay. advertising. In York, so wasn't really there a lot, right. and his mother got sick. And just from like what I know and what I've studied from other sociopaths, he didn't have good attachment with his parents. Like he didn't have the proper bonding. Particularly his mom. Particularly his mom had a lot of resentment, and which I think fueled later his resentment for women, and didn't have like a, a good father figure in his life who was like really there for him. And from what we've heard from different people is that he realized that he was smart. Like he was, he, he passed some like IQ test. I want to say when he was like nine or 10 or 11, like early on that eight, eight, eight. Okay. eight. Yeah. So early. And he was like, had this I'm special thing, but he was also really a nerd. Like he was a big fat nerd, not fat, but like, you know what I mean? Like he was, yeah, he, he was nerdy and he realized that, and this is from interviews with people that were in his classmates. He learned that he could like, Kind of, he, he learned his skills from manipulation at a really young age. He also started, became sexually hit puberty and was sexually active early. And apparently, he realized that he could like have more more than one girlfriend. And like, he figured out what to tell them. You know, you're the only one. You're so special. Blah blah blah. And like, was, you know, doing the woman thing at a very young age. We know that. Um, and then we, he w- went to RPI apparently, which is like Polytechnic Institute. Or was it that's a fancy Rensselaer. It's a fancy it's technical school, school in yeah. New York, yeah. right? That's, yeah. Rensselaer Polytechnic. I mean, it's, it's like Rice. It's not yeah. Harvard, but it's super yeah. respected. Yeah, super yeah. respected. RPI, right? And yeah. we were told that he had like three double majors or something. But since we found out that he like graduated, his two point six GPA. Yeah, GPA. I got so yeah. sick of people calling him a scientist like oh, yeah. that. Yeah. I almost wanted to blow. Yeah, I'll yeah. just say yeah, yeah. that frustrated. Me. Oh, there were, I mean, there's so many things about his, like that we never looked into his credentials and like what he, what he actually graduated with. But because he barely graduated from college, he barely yeah. graduated, yeah. but he's un, with an undergrad. Like, yeah. That, yeah, I don't think that makes you a scientist. Yeah. No, and and I'm gonna give the cliff notes here, but basically he started collect he collecting his the beginning of what would be his harem in you know in college. Yeah, his first partner Karen Unter Reiner. Um, at age of 17, and then shortly after Pam Kafritz, who was like from a wealthy family in Washington and had a ton of money, and uh, he was starting to like collect and grift, right? And also, um, grift. What do you mean, grift? Being a grifter, like which? What do you mean, you, like parasiting, parasiting off, off of the the women that he was with um, and using their money? Okay. Which cut two years later, he, he said was one of the worst traits of a female that women were grifters, like fleas on dogs that would jump from dog right. to dog. But was really talking about himself. We didn't know that at the time. <laughs> it's called projection. Um, anyway, he started collecting these people. And then he, his first, he did like he, Amway and he sold encyclopedias door to door. And he's like looking for a way to make money. And I think that he started CBI, I want to say in the 80s. 89, was I think. Consumers Byline International. This is before Costco and Sam's Club. But basically it was one of the first pyramid schemes, but he, it wasn't sold as that. Obviously it was sold as a buyer's club where you pay a membership and you have access to all these goods at a discount. Yeah. And this company apparently did like, do you remember what they said? 50 million in two years or something. Like yeah. That. Like in a, the company itself, everything. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The company itself did really, really well. And, um, then they got brought to Arkansas and he had a bunch of, you, you tell this part, cause you remember the, de- the day. Well, better? it, we're not sure it did really, really well. It's what it, we were told, it, yeah. It, <laughs> it, it made a lot of money, but it didn't pay out its employees very well. And I think 22 district attorneys from 22 different states ended up filing a lawsuit against them. And then I think the one in Arkansas was the one that kind of broke the camel's back, from what I understand. And I don't know that. Was it an MLM or? 
Yeah. yeah. It was it a was financial a, yeah. scheme. Yeah, yeah, you you bring people in and you get them to buy the membership and you get a percentage of that and things like that. So it fooled it. And basically the the I don't rem- know the details, but they basically said you just can't do an MLM ever again. You no, can't he do- paid a fine but didn't admit guilt and agreed to never open up a sales company in the state of New York. MLM. Yeah. Yeah. So- and I just you know, again, like like when you think about Joseph Smith, troubled troubled youth, mm-hmm. you know, there were always early rumors of sexual impropriety. Mm-hmm. And then he did this treasure digging thing because he was desperate for money. Mm-hmm. You know, wasn't super well educated, but but had charisma and knew how to influence people. So he does this treasure digging thing and he does it for four or five years, takes advantage of people, mm-hmm. a fraudulent scheme where he's manipulating and deceiving yeah. people. And he ends up in front of a judge and the judge says, if, if you keep doing this, you're going to live in prison. Mm-hmm. And so, so he has to, so that all implodes. And then he has to figure out how to reinvent himself. Yeah. yeah. Like and it's so, it's, it's so, same. and it's all in it's upstate New York. Yeah. Like, it's a playbook. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you look at the, the profiles of, you know, cult leaders, Jonestown, David Koresh, they all have a similar kind of. Their upbringings are all very similar. Tumultuous too. upbringing. Tumultuous upbringing, and then they all find a skill that gives them some sort of attention, and then they and they need money. And they need money. And there's also sexual impropriety yeah. involved, yeah. and they're willing to do things that most people aren't willing to do. Yeah, and lie, ar- steal, cheat. Yeah. And ar- around that time, he had so now at this point, he had a little collection of women, and he this he was taking classes at an ashram in upstate New York, and saw how the leader oh, was right. uh, adored. And everyone was just, you know, revering this person. And he's like, I'm going to do that. And, and Joseph Smith had people like Lumen Walters who would come into town and he would, he would learn from other people. Right. Right. What, yeah. what, what his opportunities might be. Right. Yeah. Or, so, or to create a book or, yeah. you know. So yeah. he decided to reinvent himself. And with these women, they did a take home test. Like we, we were told that he was the smartest man in the world. His IQ was 240, but we found out later that the test was, he had six weeks to complete it. It was take home. And he had all these other people helping him with the test. I'm a psychologist. That's not how IQ tests work. No, right? no. IQ test works, are, they're like six hours and, I'm, and a licensed psychologist administers it. Yeah. And, which, and it's very standardized. Which is why after a year, once the... Um, Guinness Book of World Records. Yeah, it was in the Guinness Book of Re- World Records. <laughs> and then a year later, they came and evaluated the process of the IQ test. And, and then the Guinness pulled it. Yeah, that's not how IQ yeah. tests work. So, but from that point on, he was touted as one as the top three problem solvers in the world. because And a, a mega Mensa. And a mega Mensa because of the test he did with a bunch of other smart women, by the way. <laughs> so this, so then he, they could decide to create um, ESP, but they were looking for someone to like teach it, to give it validity. And then they found Nancy Salzman who taught neuro-linguistic programming and Ericksonian hypnosis and was a psychologist apparently um, up in the area. And together they joined and started ESP executive success programs, which became Nexium. And those early, you know, in Joseph Smith, it's either Oliver Cowdery or Sidney Rigdon. You always have to find people with more knowledge, more credibility yes. to kind of partner with early on. And then yeah. he also needs someone to bankroll it. So in yeah. Joseph Smith's case, it was Martin Harris. In 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 Keith Raniere's case, it right. was who? Who are the early bankrollers? Like financially, say Pam Kafritz. Pam Kafritz was an early bankroller, and then Nancy Salzman gave it credibility, and she could be a teacher because she spoke in front of large groups at Con. Ed- she was working at Con Edison as a good goals yeah, teacher, right. and you know, and 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 then things really got cranking for him when he got the billionaires with right. Sarah and Claire Bronfman and the. Probably well, I, I, one of the things that's pretty interesting about it is the company started in July of 98. And by 2001, Nancy was coaching um, someone very influential in entertainment, religion, and um, energy. Energy, was it? Con Edison. So it was, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. So she, she had. So she was in the people. ear of some pretty influential people. Yeah, and that reminds me a lot of Scientology. If you can get John Travolta and yeah. if you can get Nicole Kidman and if you can get Leah Remini and mm-hmm. you get enough powerful influential right. people, we called it then uh, then the momentum yeah. starts to to grow. We call it big fish. Yeah. I had I, I had a big fish list of people that I was like slowly trying to yeah. bring in. Yeah. VIPs. Yeah. That's how they grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because okay. they build more value. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we were taught. Well, they just, you know, they give you it's marketing, right? So it's, you know, by the time I, I returned in 2006, I was impressed with how they'd overcome yeah. something that I didn't think they could. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. And I'm always just stunned by how many setbacks these 
cult leaders have along the way, but they just, they double the, down part of their, yeah, double down part of their superpower is never quitting and then learning from each mistake and never having any embarrassment. It's just like, I don't care what they throw at me. I'm coming back. Like you said, double down coming back that, stronger. You, to me, the thing that what you just said, the, the lack of embarrassment that keep pressing on to me was so audacious and bold. That, that was to me, it's like, if I got caught <laughs> or if I got, if I hit this kind of snag, like when I, whenever I like, when I was a kid and I got caught doing something or like I should have done, I'd be embarrassed. I'd stop. I'd self reflect a little bit. I'd pivot and I'd go, yeah, how did I, like start you, over. Like, like when yeah. you pulled Back the fire off. alarm as yeah. well. Like, I, like when there was lesson. things, yeah, I learned my lesson. I would go, oh yeah, that's probably not, wasn't a good idea to do that. <laughs> right? Well, that's, that's most It's your people. humble pie. And... No. Yeah. This person would go, and this is one of the things, the psychology of the narcissist that I've learned is like, they feel entitled to everything. There's nothing that they don't feel entitled to. Yeah. Your wife, your money, your whatever. And that's what they're after. And that's, whatever that thing is, no amount, of, no amount of shame or whatever is going to stop them from that pursuit. And it's, it's impressive in a sense of, it's amazing that you can just plow through that, <laughs> not, you know, but if you understand the psychology, it's scary in a lot of sense. One of the things that Keith did, and we learned this after as we put it all together, is that he loved to tell us what he was doing about, but not, not knowing it was him, right? Like this while is, he was doing, while it. he was doing it. Yeah. So it's a sociopathic, like they get great joy out of talking about something that's happened in the world, but they're doing it to us as well. Like an example, we'll give a couple of examples. Yeah. Like an example was he Logical. taught us this thing called the shifter strategy where like you, a business or anything can create a problem in the world on purpose and then be benefit from the cleanup of that problem. Mm. It's called a shifter strategy. And he's telling you to be aware of that. Be aware of that. Yes. Like, you know, you, like a like 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 a, a lawyer can be like, oh, you really this, and then they like keep milk bilking you for money, right? And the main thing they did to us is creating a problem that think we were thinking that we were broken and we needed this curriculum for the rest of our lives to be okay. As a, yeah. as an example, but it was based on deceit. We we weren't. We didn't. We didn't need it. Like maybe a five day training to improve our lives a little bit, but we need to keep taking classes for the rest of our lives. As an example, but let me tell let me tell you this one thing that I think is really interesting because he taught us about sociopaths. He called them <laughs> he, he he calls them suppressives, like in Scientology, and he did a lot of thought experiments to help us, like using metaphors to help us understand concepts. And this I'm going to paraphrase it, but it was something like this. He's like, if you really want to understand the psychology of a sociopath, think about this. Imagine so, John, you imagine this, Kara. Imagine being in prison. Okay, imagine you're in prison as you guys. Okay. And to get out, you'd have to like kill your guards. Okay. You'd have to like strangle, kill, find a knife and kill your guards. And then you could be free. Like just how does that feel? You have to kill Awful. Right. You probably don't want to kill someone. Now you find out that they're actually just robots. And all you need to do is like pull their head off and pull out some wires and press a button. Better. That, yeah. Better, right? Better. Just dismantle the robots and then you'll be free. Yeah. So he said for a sociopath, that's what it feels like. Anyone in the way of you getting anywhere is just a robot that you have to dismantle. You don't see them as humans. They're just d destroy, destroy, remove. So that is- and He was telling you to watch out for those types of people. Yeah, telling you to watch out for those types of people. <laughs> not, we'd never suspect it was him, but that's totally him. He doesn't see people as people. He sees them as, as dismantable. Dismantable, is that a word? No, he just uses them. He just uses them. He get out of my way, get out of my, and that's what he does. He uses people for power, uses people for money, uses people for sex, uses people to advance himself, all those things. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, this is something Gerardo uh, really brought to my attention. Um, I, Whenever we do Mormon Stories podcast interview of, of like people raised Mormon, this is going to maybe sound a little bit weird. We always ask them about sexual shame and what they were taught about things like masturbation and sexual exploration in their teenage years and how they were made to feel awful about it. And with almost out any exception, every Mormon youth goes through a spin cycle of serious sexual shame. And the reason why we talk about that is because I've come to believe that shame is core to the business model of a high demand religion. Because on the one hand, they need to tell you, you're amazing. You're a child of God. You have unlimited potential and we can help you be super happy. And you're awful and terrible and 
loathsome and you need us right. to be able. So it's this two handed, you're amazing. We love you and you're terrible and you need me to not be terrible. And it sounds like just like Mormonism, w w would it be fair to say that that was also you never enough, never terrible, yeah. always need to do better and you need me to get and be better. Is yeah. that fair? I mean Underneath it all, it was that's this, what the whole life issue thing. Yeah, was. we always had this thing that we were working on called our life issue, which is like the thing plan that, to yeah, work and then you a, to evolve your. Well, first you had to to identify your life issue, then you had to come up with a plan to evolve your life issue, which had to be evaluated and passed by other people. What are some examples of life issues? Um, like mine was that internally I feel like I'm worthless. I called it uh, dismissible runt was my name from really like my, and, the, the little version of myself. And you know? everything you do is designed to cover that yeah, up. Yeah, and how like to be liked. I mean, according to them, I'm doing it right now. Like here I am right. seeking attention by writing a book and being a whistleblower just to cover up the feeling that I'm nothing. Right. So that so I would have to write a plan to say this is this is what I'm going to do now. So to overcome the, the, what they call like a like me disease that I want to be liked more than I want to grow. So anytime I was going to like not be at a training and maybe go to my best friend's wedding in California, they'd be like, see, you're doing it again. They could always use How does my, that relate to your life how issue? Is that, how, yeah, that would be a gaslighting term. How does that relate to your life issue? What, what are you choosing versus your growth? So they'd leverage my supposed commitment to my growth to get to do what they wanted me to do. They would leverage your vulnerability yeah. and then use your vulnerability against you to yes. have power over you. Yeah. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. and certain people were, d were susceptible to it at different times. Sometimes I would just be like, I don't Nip, Nippy was less obedient, but I wanted to be liked. Yeah. I wanted to be liked I just and didn't and I was more obedient. Care sometimes. I was like Yeah. Fuck you. <laughs> and I was be like, yeah. Nippy, don't do that. Because I'm I, yeah. I was more of a good girl. But it reminds me of the confession confessions in the Catholic Church or auditing in Scientology. Mm -hmm. They gotta find out enough about you. Yeah to where they know where your weak spots yeah. are because if they can manipulate the weak spots and make you feel guilt and shame make you feel like you continually are making mistakes and you need them to feel better. That's one of the main ways they have power and control yeah. over you. Is that fair to say? Yep. Yeah, no. And, and, and I don't say that I <clears throat> didn't have the buy-in. My buy-in was different. So I don't say that as a self-preservation comment. I just say my buy-in was like when the life issue thing was worked, it just it used them. It just didn't work. What in was the your same life issue? Way. I don't even remember. Oh, really? It was like, Something about results. Yeah, yeah. It was something about I identify myself through my results and my achievement. Like hustling and, for love through yeah, performance. Yeah, yeah. No, I feel good about myself when I'm achieving. Yeah. That's it. And I don't I don't give myself self love or something like that. So how how does that relate to me trying to grow the organization? I want results within the organization and I want to feel good. And there you weren't gonna talk me out of being successful. Mm -hmm. But that was I also just, very confusing. Like, yeah, it, it, it was, was a success program. But then when you had the success, they'd be like, well, you're just being attached. It now, seems now like it could be a way to kind so of get he, you to chill out and to, and to back off. And, and neuter me. Yeah, to neuter a you. Exactly. Yeah. But, exactly. But, 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 here, but here's the other thing. It, it's If that's something that I do to feel good, how am I ever going to feel good? And you're never going to enjoy your results if you have an attachment to your results. Just kind of word salad. It's that's like a, that's a good part it, of the Buddhism. Red Porsche, the yeah. red Porsche <laughs> example. So the red Porsche is like if I want to buy the red Porsche and I'm pursuing the red Porsche and I have an attachment to the red Porsche. When I get it, yeah, am I going to enjoy it? Yeah, it's it's the happiness trap, right? Yeah. So so there's good. Fair part, enough. There's some truth in that with the happiness right. trap that nothing from the outside world will cause you to be happy, right? So but that, they, but, didn't over, they didn't offer a roadmap out of that. It was intellectual and basically masturbation. Then you, stay in the, no, you stay in the shit so that you feel shitty about yourself <clears throat> so that you can try to pay more, take more classes to get out of that. But really, so that was what was confusing. It was like, and also, also by the way, just to jump ahead, I think why we were able to get out when we did, because we didn't, even though we were very devoted, we didn't fully buy in. We never moved permanently to Albany. I never gave up those things, which was always held against me. Mm -hmm. Like the higher ranks would say, do you see that your attachment to materialism is stopping you from being the more the highest version of yourself? And I'm like, yeah, I guess I'm going to keep my attachment to materialism in my head. But I was like, yeah, I'm going to work on that. And but like, I like my apartment. I like my community. You know, the inconsistencies are also to what you're relating to in the organization. You have someone who's not nearly as successful at you, giving you advice on success, and I was just kind of like, 
you know, it's the old adage, like, why are you going to take financial advice from someone who doesn't have money yeah. and is borrowing money from you? It just, it always felt like the person, quote unquote, coaching me doesn't have the acumen that they're trying to coach me in. And those were always things that when I would get feedback or something, I'd always have a, yeah, but you don't really know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know? I learned so. to follow the things and take the things that I like and then pretend to follow the other yes. things. We because, both kind of did. Well, also because we had buy-in that we thought it was a good organization. Yeah. Yeah. When you would come in and take a five-day, I thought you potentially identifying your life issue would be a good thing for you down the road. Yeah. Like if you did a five-day, John, I bet you'd actually really like it. Like the bare bones of the five-day curriculum was quite awesome. Because it's warmed over secular yeah, 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 yeah. 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 That's the same with Landmark yeah. Forum. And it's, Psychology you know, 101. Yeah, like, yeah, like how to communicate, how to build your self-esteem, how to have a better relationship with money, how to have a better relationship with yourself, how to love yourself. Like, And it was so good, and it created that Processed that food. What? It cre but it created also that, um, what's it called? Yanya talks about like that elevated, uh, Elevated emotion. Elevated emotion. Yeah, elevated emotion. Yeah, elevated emotions. So Which you, Mormons call the Holy Ghost or the yeah, Spirit. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I okay. had all that. Yeah. I had you can all manufacture that. that. You manufacture I people a, to feel elevation emotion. I had yeah. elevated emotion. And then you can manipulate them. Tony Robbins is great at it. Yeah. I wish I had just done the five day. Yeah. But then I was like, I need to finish the five day because yeah. there's the 16 day. And of course, once you've done the, uh, the first level, then there's level twos. And don't forget level two, A, B, C, and D and stories, Ugh. traps, and patterns. And because, and then this whole, there's, there was always more curriculum that you had to take. As I'm trying to analyze this just as a observer, like it, humans biologically, however, we evolved to never feel satisfied. Because right. if you just sit on the savanna satisfied, you're eaten by the lion. So we have an unfillable hole in our hearts and souls because we're always supposed to be striving, improving, protecting, building, because that's what it takes to have kids on the savannah and protect them and to build a society where you don't get eaten by a pack of lions or Particularly wolves. Particularly in America. And but everywhere. Yeah, this well, is the human condition. It is the human condition, but it, there's in America, it's nurtured and it's fostered. In other countries, you have governments that subtly try to neuter you and create an equality. We're all equal and stuff like that. I don't think you can kill that spirit. We're well, hardwired to in thrive the, in, the in, in a sense. Remember that even the couch potato wants a yeah. better recliner. They want more snacks. Like you yeah. owe even someone who's lazy wants more. <laughs> and, my, right? and my point is it, our, our need to self-improve is insatiable. Yes. yes. And you can never arrive. That's what the happiness trap is. You, yes. you seek happiness, then you're always disappointed. And there's always suffering in the world. And so if you can come up with some sort of curriculum or doctrine or theology that is probably self-contradictory, it's not, there's going to be some, enough good there yes. to make people feel like, okay, well, this is going to help me. But then you use their weaknesses and even sometimes contradictory doctrine just to keep people on a shame cycle of perceived self-improvement, but for the leaders, the goal is not the actualization of no. the, of the Absolutely followers. Not. It's the maintenance and growth of their power and yes. influence. Mm -hmm. you know. And I think that's the formula for how all these things work. I, I, 100%. Yeah. And yeah. keeping I would, people I would in, even a, add to that. in a, would, sta in a yeah. state of shame yeah. and, and low self-esteem so that they're so dependent. They're compliant compliant yeah. and dependent. And also isolated yeah. from anything on the outside that would help them recognize, well, this is not really good for you. Uh, isolated is huge. Yeah. You yeah. got to create that bubble. Yeah. yeah. And Mormonism was, has that bubble right now in space. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and to your point, like, you know, I can remember being like 17, 18 years old and winning a football game or something like that, mm -hmm. winning a championship. And oh, I'll be happy then. I, I was happy. Yeah. The next day I like wanted to, I wanted to go do it again. Yeah. Yeah. And take Tom Brady. What, what's your favorite ring? The next one. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's, a, and, it's a cycle. And yeah. When I, Sarah and I were sitting uh, and I woke up at like five in the morning and both my kids were here and Sarah was in the bed and I was just kind of sitting there going, because I think I still have aspects of what's the next thing. What's the next thing. And I took inventory on my life. I have to told you this. And I was like, it was dark, quiet. And I was with my family. I was like, this is everything. I was like, I'm actually, and it didn't feel like it. This is the distinction I'm making is it didn't feel like I was doing well in life. That makes sense. But we have a successful podcast. I've got two beautiful children, a beautiful wife, and I just booked an acting job that in a, in a TV show. Um, and I'm like, why is it so hard for me to go? This is awesome. All the time. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. All the time. Like, yeah. why, why, do I, why do I get up and think I need to add to this every day? Like, why do I get up and feel like, why is that my objective? Why isn't it my objective? Enjoy this more. Yeah. And it's just, it, to me, it's my life issue or whatever, but that, that is a struggle I think we all kind of yeah. can relate to, no matter. And, and you hear it even with people who are winning seven Super Bowls yeah. or winning yeah. an Oscar. Like, you, you recognize it's a human condition. Yeah. And I just sat there and I was like, this is, this is great. This is, this is practice. I'm winning. Yeah. And that's what and Jesus that's, and the Buddha yeah. try to tell us is focus on the present moment. Right. Eckhart Tolle, don't focus on the past. Don't focus on the future. Live in the present moment. And so we're like, oh, wow, that's really wise. <laughs> yes. But the hole right. never goes away. Right. Okay. So we're going to have to skip different parts of the story, but let's jump to kind of uh, the, the events that lead up to you guys getting married, because it almost felt like a Nexium wedding. Um, and I'm just wondering kind of, and just briefly describe what your roles with Nexium were leading up to your marriage and kind of how you met. Sure. This is all in painful detail in, in my book. Yep. But yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I went up the ladder. Here's the book. Oh, thanks. Scarred by, by Sarah Edmondson. So that's what we want you to buy, but just to get you to buy. I, I, call, I call it scared. Thanks, Deb. Yeah. I, I, I purposely, I say painful because there was this ladder of promotions, like getting your next sash and the stripes on it was like in, in karate, like in martial arts, you had to get promoted to the next level. Is that motivating to have levels? Why do they have it, levels? Why do they always do levels? Well, there's why we were told there was levels and then why I think he had levels. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, I, I, what we were told and why I liked it at the beginning is that it was very measurable. If you did X, Y, and Z, you'd get to the next level. And I liked that. And I went up, the, I went up pretty quick because I was motivated. I was a hustler. I liked to work hard. And he, if anyone thought that was weird, I'd be like, well, how is it different than martial arts? This is the first time there is a quantifiable growth or Boy structure. Scouts. Yeah, or Boy, Boy Scouts, yeah. 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 Quantifiable structure <clears throat> to, your, to your enlightenment. And I say up until now, and Nancy would say like as a therapist, there's no way to measure happiness. There's no way to measure your success, but now we have a measurable way, a measurable system. I'm like, that's amazing, right? So I really liked it at first. And the, the straight path measured your ability to teach and the curriculum, like your mastery of the skills, it measured your ability to bring in people because you can't be successful unless you can bring people along with your ideas. It wasn't, it wasn't about recruitment. It was about building that skill set. Like you can't, you can't do anything on your own. What were you going to say? I was just going to say, I'm, I'm going to guess it's not about actual self-development. It's about acquiring the skills and abilities necessary to help the organization be successful. Ding, <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Yeah. And Although you think you're, you're yes. self-developing the whole time. Well, the, the, but what you're really doing is growing yes. the organization. Yes. You, yeah. I got rewarded because I was a good recruiter. I was, I've always been good at sales and always been good at sharing whatever it is that I'm passionate about. But the third thing was your own emotional maturity, which wasn't evaluated by you is evaluated by other people. Who so are less emotionally mature than you. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and ethical. <laughs> yeah. So I, I went up the start path pretty fast, but then I decided like there's different career paths within the organization. You could do sales, you could become a teacher, you could be what's called an EM practitioner an exploration of meaning practitioner, which is basically like a therapist trying to help people with their emotional stuff. And I decided not to go that route because the path seemed really long, really not measurable. They kept changing the goalposts and the money wasn't as good. And I wanted to make money and I wanted to bring Nexium to Vancouver and open a center. So I became a center owner in 2009 and I was in charge of a bunch of people with sales. Um, Nippy was, what were you doing? At what point? Well, he wants to know how, what led up to our marriage. Yeah. Well, so I was r running the New York City Center with about three or four other people. Um, and I would teach the classes in New York, sometimes some of the trainings. And I found my niche particularly with the goals program. So people would come to a class and they'd take goals classes or whatever. And I ended up actually, when we started dating, moving to Vancouver, helping with Vancouver and L.A. Eventually. So traveling around LA. and then eventually yeah. head of the men's organization. And we did have an Axiom wedding. It was, I mean, there was other people there, my family and friends, but it was lots of people from the community and it was a big celebration. Do we and need it, to pause for this? No, no. And it's usually super important 
usually high demand religions or organizations need to grab things like births, weddings, coming of age ceremonies and deaths, because those are like pivotal moments in life. And you want to connect those really emotional experiences with the organization. Mm -hmm. And that's why religions are always like christening of the baby, Mm -hmm. kid coming into maturity. Mm -hmm. Oh, now you're an adult. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're getting married. Oh, someone passed away. There's always a ritual for that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. But I, I never felt those two aspects of our lives integrated well. And I didn't want them to. Mm-hmm. We weren't actually encouraged to get married. We were discouraged to get married. Yeah. Well, that's because Keith wanted yeah. Yeah. what he wanted. Yeah. Okay. So um, so this is great. So you guys get married, and there's a lot of next people at your wedding. What did that mean to have your wedding f- half half filled with next people? Did it almost feel like you were like getting married into the organization a little bit or not? Or um, if anything, it was like we thought it would be a great opportunity for my family members to see how amazing and cool and vibrant our community was. Every every event we ever had was always an opportunity to bring in more people. Yeah. So every member a missionary kind of thing. Or yeah. you know, I I thought it would just put them at ease. Yeah, like they're like, look, we're 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 so happy, and I mean, I found out later from family members who weren't part of next that they were really put off because we were so happy. Yeah. We were, and, and not many of us were drinking. Yeah. So they were like, what, why are they like, was the, drinking discouraged? Drinking was discouraged. Uh, well, well, no, you didn't not drink, babe, but like other drinking was to anything that anything you would partake from the outside would be a dependency. So drugs and alcohol were d- discouraged. And that was also another inconsistency because Nancy was super dependent on coffee to, perform to be on stage. Like that's the only thing I saw her consume. Yeah. She only <laughs> drank coffee, but it was, it was confusing because, um, and back to earlier, what you said about like sex being shameful, what was really looked down upon is you didn't want to be satiative was the word. If you were satiating in anything, it's okay to have a drink. Like it would be okay to have a drink every now and then, but if you're satiating in alcohol, when you should be working on your goals, that was problematic. Or if you're having, and I subscribe to that. I mean, I just, for me, I, I got that. Yeah. That was one thing I was aligned with. Yeah. That yeah. made that made sense. But also yeah. you would do your own thing on the weekends and not. Yeah, no, I would go smoke a doob or, and have a beer and watch the ball game. Like I didn't have a, I didn't, because I knew I wasn't doing anything bad. I was more obedient. You know? Well, if you look at Stephen Hassan's bite model, mm-hmm. high demand organizations, they need to control your behavior yeah. by some sort of rigid rules that make you always feel like you need to do better and you need to follow the rules. Mm-hmm. Um, and that also sets you apart from other people so that the people who are members of the in-group feel somehow different or differentiated mm-hmm. and maybe even superior than the people outside of the group who don't mm-hmm. engage in the same behaviors. Yeah. And then, of course, they have to control. That's the B and bite. Yeah. And they have to control, control the information that the members of the group receive. Mm-hmm. Right. Because if you get information, you can have thoughts that lead you out of the organization. So they control the information so they can c- control your thoughts. Yeah. And then they use emotion to manipulate you. And that's kind of the bite model. And so I'm not surprised to hear kind of behavioral, and there's probably a lot more kind of rigid Lots behavioral. More. What were some of the bees? I mean, one of the first things that they had us do from day one, again, there's like good in this and then the bad of it, like what was good but and how it helped us, but then how they use it to manipulate. But they had us doing something called a persistency from day one, where you choose something to do um, every day. In terms of the bite model, um, they had us doing something from the beginning called a persistency where we chose to do something every day for a minimum of like five minutes or whatever you could manage. And you'd grow uh, grow that amount until you were um, could make it up to like a half an hour or an hour about learning, like learning a new skill or learning a new language or something you've been wanting to do but haven't been able to do, like sorting your tax receipts. Or like for me, it was I, I was doing it to learn Spanish and like... Build, you know, building new things. And by the end, I had like six or seven persistencies happening at the same time. And we were encouraged to do that because you're trying to like be the best version of yourself. So in terms of controlling our behavior, I would say there was a lot of things like that. And your average devoted, obedient Nexium member like myself would have many persistencies. You'd be pretty clean, you know, not doing a lot of um, drugs or alcohol, exercising very regularly. All the women were teeny tiny, very, very thin. 
Um, Almost like disor- encouraging disordered eating uh, yes. uh, for the women. Yes. And, and Keith's immediate purview, yes. Yeah. I mean, we, we found out later that the women were had to be thin for him. Yeah. They were but I was, I was thin and I wasn't with him, but I was encouraged to be – like I – I think I had a little bit of, even of, a, of an eating disorder because I was so focused on being fit, you know, yeah. and being in shape. Yeah. Um, what else? I mean, just just work, just constantly working on yourself and like writing your life issue and doing your persistencies and and having a goal, being in goals lab and and going to class and getting your next stripe. It was just a good go 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 go. Like people who were really all in were just like there was never any downtime. So in terms of you controlling your behavior and then, you know. Keeping you super busy. Keeping you super busy. Super busy all the time. The first time I I, I took a step back and took a break, I was like, we didn't have the space to think. Well, breaks didn't feel good. Yeah. We were trained that, that, why would you take a vacation from your life? It was sort of the idea. Like you, like it's, it's not okay. Vacation. The definition of vacation is vacating your time, emptying out your time. And what's confusing about that is what's wrong with self-improvement. Yeah. But the problem is the, a couple things. Tell me if this was your experience. They keep you super busy. And in a way that being super busy is a way for you to drown out and mute out your own internal Mm -hmm. voice. Mm -hmm. And in terms of gaining wisdom, you're basically learning their way of life, yep. which is molded to turn you into an instrument and a missionary to meet their needs yep. instead of really fine tuning yourself yep. to know what you want and need and then to to create your own individual self empowerment. So it's confusing because there's lots of self improvement, but it's for the benefit of the organization, not to to self develop for your own personal intrinsic benefit. Right. And, yeah. and, and also, I, I created boundaries. Yeah, Nippy was better at that than um, I was. And I think Which some, meant you probably weren't as much in the inner circle. I, was, I, well, I didn't care to be in the inner circle. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't I wanted a, him to be more it in wasn't, the inner circle. It wasn't appealing to me. Yeah. There was nothing, there was no one mm. in the inner circle that I was going, I want to be like, nope, yeah. none of them. Yeah. And I took tacitly a little bit of shit for it, mm-hmm. um, but I didn't care. Yeah. And I was willing to fight. So I kind of, and I think we, we spoke. I had my boundaries. Like you gave me some crap. Like, why don't you want, I was like, cause that's not what I want to do. Like, you know, this, this is where I begin and that starts. And, and, and I'd, I'd, I didn't like pressure. Like, so they were strategic in who they sent after me, I think sometimes. And particularly with like, there was a couple of trainings that they were running during Thanksgiving and they were like, well, you know, Keith's running at this. I was like, good for Keith. I'm going home to see my family. Like that's how this works. They'd run them over New Year's. I'd leave and go watch the Rose Bowl because I wanted to watch the Rose Bowl. I wanted to see USC versus Texas. <laughs> you know what Nippy I mean? Was like in the model, he was called Defiant. Yeah, they call it Defiant, but I didn't. You, that's where I was impenetrable, and I think that ultimately saved us. Now, that doesn't mean I wasn't all in in certain aspects, but I had my boundaries. But, I'd yeah. leave a training early because the gym was closing. So it was. So, it was yeah. important for your family that Nippy yeah. had some emotional detachment. But as I'm thinking about the self-interest of the organization, they want to be able to, they want to have their inner circle where they're really having the power and the influence and getting what they need. Mm -hmm. But they want to have this outer ring who's not in the know about what's going on in the inner circle where these people are like, hey, I'm independent and I do what I want. And this isn't a cult and there's nothing weird going on. And so they kind of need nippies. Yes. Right? As kind of fronts. Yes. To yeah. kind of say, we're not a cult. It's just Look at Nippy. We're Look not a cult. He's and an independent, Look at his face. strong also, man. But, you know? but, but here's another thing, too. Like, <laughs> here's another thing. Like, I would sit with people and they'd be like, it's a cult. I was like, yeah, it's a little bit of a cult. But, you know, it's, if you want, if it's a cult where you want to go do your goals and peace out, you can do that. Yeah. We used to say if it's, it's a, it's a cult of happy, out, successful like, people. Right. <laughs> I'd flat out yeah. say that. But we didn't understand. But you didn't know. What a cult really they was. Needed, they and, needed yeah. you guys to be making the cover. Yes. For what it was and going even on like inside. people at the end of a five day who come in, like one of the reasons I did it was because Nippy said it was a cult, and he was like totally like transparent. Exactly. And and, exactly. and then they'd be like, you know, thank you because it's not, and you know, I can, li- <laughs> yeah. and you know, I was like, and but I thought yeah. that was true. Yeah. And yeah, that yeah. was a big part because you could come and go. Yeah. That and that's what I, that's what was compelling is like when I said it, there wasn't an emotional inconsistency that I was fronting. That's yeah. actually what I believe because I actually embodied. You don't have to do that. Yeah. Yep, exactly. 
Really quick, Sarah, what was your, it seems like you were a recruiter, kind of like a missionary. You yeah. were basically a missionary. I was. But for Nexium and mm -hmm. Keith. And so what were you recruiting people to do and be? Well, I would meet somebody and pretty much anyone I met ever, anybody, yeah. I would be constantly looking to see, are they the kind of people that I would want to work with? Do I want them in our team, team humanity, we called it. <laughs> Saving the world, <laughs> big Saving the grandiose world. goals. Yeah. Right? And, and we were like, we were trained to go to events and look for the bright lights to look for the people who really sparkle <laughs> and like have a big network and really shine and, and, you know, not trained to look for the broken people who need it, which happens sometimes, but I was trained to be like, who are these people? What's their mission? Are they aligned with us? And what are they looking for in their lives? And can we provide it? And, and that's you want what I, Steve Young and Donnie Marie Osmond yeah. fronting your organization. Yeah. You want John Travolta and Kelly Preston, you know, yes. and Nicole Kidman fronting your organization. Yes. How do we, or people with money, People so money. How and do you, hard workers. The Marriott's, you know, how do you get those people, right? And hard workers. Hard workers. Yeah. Worker bees. Yeah. And, right? and Nancy said this all the time in public. She said, it, you know, I say this in my book, if we had more Sarah Edmondson's, this company would be so <laughs> successful. Yeah. And I felt really good about that, right? Yeah. So I was looking for people like myself, like people who worked hard and had a big network and wanted to grow and were enthusiastic and, on, you know, social yeah. butterflies, really. Yeah. But I didn't realize, you know, at the time that... Um, well, it's a lot of things I didn't realize at the time, but in terms of recruitment, I felt really good about that, that I, I was good at it and I was touted as that and I was the poster child for it, you know? And because of that, that's why I grew up the ranks, you know, really fast because I was recruiting so many people. <clears throat> yeah, and that's, we'll, we'll come back to that. Yeah. But I mean, so many people that I meet who serve Mormon missions, mm -hmm. part of their deep regret is that they were tools of the organization yeah. to recruit others mm -hmm. when they didn't know what, what they were really recruiting yeah. people into. And, and just right? to say what, what I believed I was recruiting into people into, even if it was just to take a five day, I believed I was going to be inviting them to something where they'd get all the tools that they needed to improve their life. Yeah. And I felt really good about that. What I didn't realize is that it was ultimately a funnel because the five day in itself was pretty benign. But if you get hooked and you want to continue into the 16 day and then move to Albany, yeah. that's where the bad stuff happened. Right. Yep. And by the way, like, we even had, I think I mentioned this when you were on our podcast, but we were even taught that people are going to call us a cult. And mm -hmm. the, the answer- Inoculated. To, yeah. Inoc yeah. yeah. And, and, and the answer to that was a cult has, there's bad things happening. And if, if there's bad things, like what are the bad things? And if we're murdering people or if we're stealing money from people, then people would say we're thieves or we're murderers, but, but they're not. They're just saying it's a cult. What's the bad thing? I couldn't see the bad thing. <laughs> Yeah, and you think about why are Mormon missionaries 18 and 19 years old? Right. Mm. It's because they know so little. Right. You think you'd you think you'd want missionaries who knew the most, but no. If you're doing shady secret things inside, you want missionaries who know the least, right. who aren't on the inner circle. Yep. Because they're gonna be the best salespeople. Yep. Right? Yeah. 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 And I think that's why I kind of remained was remained untouched until the last few months. They yeah. kind of didn't they didn't give me too much of a hard time because I was just a good recruiter. I was bringing in so many people. I was filling the pipeline. I'll, I'll never figure that out. No, I figured I, it out. No, I know. I'll never figure out how they thought I'd be cool with. Oh yeah. That. Yeah. Just, okay. Yeah. So just, what was going on? Let's just jump there. What was the inner circle? What was going on? And this is where I think where DOS sure. comes out yeah. and, and the, the clutterizing. Now let you go and then okay. I'll add in where I think. So what was Keith yeah. really doing behind the scenes? Sure. So yeah. Yeah, if you keep in mind, there's like what we saw. Well, can and then say, what Keith was doing, what he was always doing with women. He was always yeah. doing just, it from the beginning. He just yeah. hit it. Right. Yeah. He decided to keep it from the people that he was growing because they weren't integrated enough. They weren't yeah. evolved enough to understand why having many women in his bed or his circle or whatever was actually totally okay. So when I joined, Such I was told racket. that he was a celibate monk. He was a renunciate. He took no money from the company. He didn't, he was driven everywhere. He doesn't have a driver's license, he doesn't have a car because he doesn't believe in material possessions. Yeah. That's so, how he got around, that's how he got around the legal ramifications exactly, yeah, of, of liability. Yes. The liability. Yeah. That was all stay, about avoiding liability. Stay off the it radar. wasn't that he was a, a monk, right? No. no. <laughs> and I assume that the women around him, because there were women around him, I, and there were some of, some of them were my close friends, not yeah. close friends, but good friends. Yeah. And I thought that they were there to help him, yeah. that he was so busy using his scientific mind to solve the world's <laughs> problems that he needed someone to go cook for him and choose out his clothes and drive him around. That made sense. Yeah. He had assistants. Yeah. I didn't realize that there were all women that he was sleeping with. When I mean, we counted from the women that we knew, like verified because they're out and we speak to them, most of them, that there was something like 40 to 60 women 
And at any given time, I would say that there was probably 12 in Albany, 15 maybe, that he could call in a night and who had their phones on waiting for the off chance that Keith would say, okay. Booty call. Booty call. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Booty call. And Joseph so, got up to 40, it looks like. Yo, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. I seem to be a number. And uh, <laughs> I think 40 is the number. 40 is a good number for <laughs> your average. Just, just, that they just top off there. <laughs> yeah, 40 is enough. enough. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's what he was doing. And, you know, I really do think that he saw, thought, I'm going to create this, this really helpful goals program stolen from Scientology and Landmark and NLP and homogenized Buddhism yeah. and you know, all these different things, repackage it. So people are hooked, teach you that you shouldn't be dependent on anything in the outside world, except for this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and then keep them. And then, and listen, what's interesting, it ramped up, right? Like what got me hooked in the end with DOS, which is the secret society. Let me explain this now. Yeah. Okay. And again, this is very complicated to explain. The details are in the book cause it's, it's too, it's too complex, but ultimately he brought, he created a secret society called women, I'm sorry, a secret society of women called DOS. And in the name of female empowerment, in the name of female oh empowerment, my God. after years of this training called SOP society of protector for men and Jeunesse, which is, was a training for women. And all of that training had a bunch of indoctrination that set us up to be ripe to say, yeah, that's a good next step. So that's how the so best normalized abuse, normalized abuse, but normalized also like the reasons why I would even choose to say yes. So at that point we believed that, um, you know, that men and women were, um, you know, we had our different primitive wiring and men were wired this way and women were wired this way and women Very were gendered, gendered all and, coupled yeah. with true. Yeah. Truisms, some, some truisms, yeah. you know, women generally are more, this or that. emotional and yeah. men are generally can like override their emotions to go kill the tiger. And men need to learn that more. And women need to understand character and discipline and more. Cause really we're just princesses. And then we'd start to divert. Like we're princesses. We're entitled. We're grifting fleas off the backs of dogs, jumping from one host to the other, because really we don't want to work because we're entitled princesses and we gossip and like all these negative things to the point where like, I thought I was building a sisterhood, but I actually really had a quite a disdain. Maggie, I was so bummed out by the misogyny. Oh, it's awful. The, 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 the vow shows. Yeah. yeah. And you have to understand like people watching, but like, wasn't that so much misogynistic? It wasn't presented as misogyny. It was presented as let's look at the misogyny in society so we can evolve it. Right. Right? Yeah, right. That's yeah. how it was presented. It's that yeah. word salad thing. Like you yeah. call well, it, right? it's also, but the thing is and here, and this isn't uh, a support for it. I'm giving context as to how you can go. Okay. I relate. I subvert my emotions to do stuff. And, and I kind of dismiss a lot of the things that are going on with me emotionally. And if you statistically, and you have statistics to support it, right. You know, a lot of men or most men are in suicide. There's a lot of things that go on there. I wanted to get in touch with that. So it's yeah. under the guise of right. looking at these things while slipping in all these misogynistic. So that's the work I showed up them. for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like Most we're gonna them. we're gonna undermine all these things in society by practicing them here in the organization. Yes. <laughs> and by the end, I remember. I'll just tell you something. Then, and I don't know if I've ever spoken about this publicly. We were going through something, and after talking with one of my Jeunesse female wise woman leaders, the answer was that I needed to be more subservient. I needed to come home and like change my state and be a little bit Mrs. Like leave it to Beaver, Mrs. Cleaver, right? And be happy wife and not dump my emotions on my husband. And that would change the whole dynamic. And so like, that was something that I was taught. Yeah, they're trying intimacy. to undermine emotional intimacy between partners yeah. because if you guys are too strong and connected, yeah. then, then they don't have as much power over totally. each of you or yeah, that's interesting. Combined. I didn't consider that would be the effect. Yeah. 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 I mean, truthfully, yeah. when we got out, Nippy and I had to like, learn a bunch of stuff about how to communicate. And yeah, when you don't talk about your vulnerable things with your spouse, you're yeah. not developing emotional well, intimacy. I, I'd yeah. say the biggest thing that was starting to have a chasm was you you were always on your phone with the DOS thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause they keep you super busy. Cause and, and well, I had to be responsive. Well, and, and that, that to me, I go, I understand you're doing an exercise but, and I didn't challenge it. So, and, and just slowly I had to be more four and more. to five to six months, we weren't connected. We weren't connected at all. Right. And also yeah. we never even like, when we got married, we never even had a honeymoon because there was yeah. no time. <laughs> yeah, high demand religions don't encourage strong, healthy, emotional intimacy in marriages mm -hmm. because they want you married to the organization, not to right. each other. Yeah, and if there was ever ever something that I wanted to express, like I was, you know, I'd like to, 
like you said, even connect more, but you know, and like have a and the response would be, and that's no harm. Like this is what Nippy was trained to say. He'd be like, "Why do you think you need that?" Not like, "Oh, let's talk about that." It was always like, "Why do I need that? What's missing in me that I'm looking for more connection?" Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> like that's it's it's the, uh, it was this con- we were gaslighting You're each so other. Needy. Yeah, that You're was so no needy, Sarah. No true. Like <laughs> Nippy would say, "You're you're needy." And uh, I, I still I, say it sometimes. <laughs> it's like, I can't provide that for you. Like, you've got to figure that out within yourself. Yeah. Like, our therapist now has helped us so much be like, well, that's not actually not how a good relationship works. Like, you support and each I, other. And, and truthfully, I, even when I had the impulse to kind of address it with her, I didn't feel like that would be helping her. Yeah. No, it's true. Mm-hmm. So I'd what be was throwing her a lifeline yeah. where she should be able to be self-sufficient. Yeah. yeah, we were, yeah. We, women need to be more self-sufficient and more self-reliant like men. Yeah. So talk about just this slave caveat. Thing. I'm well, not yeah. that self-sufficient. She needs to help me with a lot of stuff. Yeah, so just, yeah. that's, 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 that's a relationship. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> so give our listeners and viewers, nobody has any, the, this idea of slaves and, yeah. and then the, ultimately the branding, okay. I'm nobody, gonna, nobody, this is where it gets more intense than probably what most people ever experienced in Mormonism. Yeah. And I say this in my speech tomorrow as well. Like I always am he- I'm hesitant to talk too much about it because I don't want to alienate your, your listenership because it's so extreme and so violent. But ultimately what it ended up being is that he wanted people, the women in his circle were had started to defect. And this ha- around the time that his, um, you know, some of once his- Once they re- realized it was abusive. Once they realized yeah. it was abusive, they were leaving and- Saying stuff. And saying stuff and being whistleblowers. And so I think he started to create this curriculum, which set us up for an invitation to what was called a uh, secret society for women. That And in Mormonism, think about the Mormon temple ceremony and the endowment, the super, in the Masonic Lodge, the super secret ceremony inner group so that you could actually control people and recruit more. Anyway, I'm just yeah, yeah. making the connections. No, and they weren't branding people, but they were doing initiatories in like cinnamon temple, whiskey. They're in re- a bath they're, of <laughs> yeah, they're renaming people. They're giving them new underwear. They're making them make these covenants and oaths, and it's all super same, secret. Same thing. And then they're threatening people with with severe penalties if they ever divulge Defect. the secrets, right? right? And it's all grooming behavior. Right. right. All, we were totally grooming. Mean, even the curriculum I just mentioned to get yeah. us to even say yes to this. And I was invited by my best friend, who's the. Can I add one more thing before you? Once I just said maid of honor. You but, do that. Yeah. We were talking earlier about how these people pivot, and they refine it. Yeah. Keith's wake had had a series of women, all ages, all groups, leaving, going to law enforcement, those sorts of things, Mm -hmm. right? So I think he figured out, that's my only problem that I need to address. Mm -hmm. You need to lock down loyalty. How do I ensure- Yeah, how do I ensure- Loyalty. And loyalty, and even when they leave, how do I ensure they don't say anything? Yeah. 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 As you were. So so even just to hear about this thing from my best friend who said- that she was going to invite me to something that would take my, my career to the, you know, my, my everything to the next level, which should have been a red flag. Like, okay, wait, the tools I've been doing for 12 years don't work. Now I need to do something else. Yeah. But I trusted her. Like literally she was on my will, the godmother for our children. This is Lauren. Lauren Salzman. Which is the daughter of Nancy, yes. who was Keith's and, right hand yes. woman. Right? And, and truthfully, I respected her and held her on a pedestal probably more than I did Keith, which was un- unusual for the company. Like most people are like, oh my God, Keith, he's so great. And I'm like, Lauren is who I wanted to be like, Yeah. yeah. you know, in terms yeah. of my role model in the company. So she's inviting me to this thing. It sounds crazy to even hear about it though, the secret thing I have to provide collateral, which also sounds crazy, but for months, actually no years, people have been putting down collateral other things. I'm committing to do X, Y, Z. And if I don't, I'm going to give $500 to X, Y, Z. So like people had things on the line that they were using to what would they called keep their word. So I was giving collateral to keep my word of secrecy that even if I said no to this thing, I would never talk about it. So that was the first step. But the problem is once they had collateral from you, they then had collateral from you, <laughs> which is another way of saying blackmail. So when I heard about the thing and the way that Lauren presented it, made it sound like really cool. A group of women who are taking themselves to the next level and holding themselves account- accountable and using all the tools that we learned, but like going extreme with it. And at this point, I, you know, I had a, I had a, th- a three-year-old. I was kind of like, uh, you know, I, was, I had lots of problems that I wasn't even willing to voice to myself with the company. So I was kind of having some struggles. Do you need to cough? Go. <laughs> I was voicing, we don't stuff like I that. Was yeah. voicing the problems. If he was voicing the problems. Yeah. But my point is, is that, and Lauren, just as a sidebar, like she'd come teach our first five day and I loved it because she, 
I felt that there were things in our first five day, like rules and rituals, calling Keith Vanguard sashes. I'm like, oh God, people are going to think this is so weird. She made it cool. She's like, yeah, you know, like a judge wears his robes and we wear our sash. And like. And these are different colored sashes different that colored represent sashes. advancement in the organization. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, like Tenderfoot and Star and Life and Eagle Scout. It's yeah. just like that. Yeah, like, and martial arts. Or like General, Colonel, Major, yeah. Captain, Lieutenant, military. And, and all of right. those yeah. things we would talk about in the five day. Yeah. You know, the military does this and martial arts does this and we do this. Totally cool. Yeah. And we call the judge. Self improvement. Yeah. And we call the doctor doctor once yeah. they've earned it. Yep. And we call Vanguard Vanguard because he's earned it. You know, <laughs> yeah. no big deal. Yeah. So she was really cool like that. And, and the way that she presented was like, I'm going to mentor you and I'm going to be your mentor. And except we're going to call it master slave. <laughs> but like, I'm not really, your, you're not really my slave. Like you, you live in Vancouver and I, and like, but like slave for what? Like, what are you going to have me do? She's like, well, you have, you're taking a lifetime vow of obedience to me, but I'm only going to be doing things that are good for your growth. And in the yeah. Mormon temple, it's called the law of obedience, literally. Oh and you bow gosh. your head and say yeah. yes in the Mormon temple, the law of obedience. Okay. Wow. So I, w I was making a vow. I had to make a vow of obedience to Lauren, who'd be my master. But really, it's just like a coach. <laughs> yeah. Right? We'll just call it a slave. We'll just call it a yeah. slave. <laughs> yeah, we'll call it a slave. Cute little name. And tomato, tomato. Yeah. And you're going to have to, at some point, find a necklace that would symbolize like your commitment, kind of like a slave collar, but you get to choose the necklace. Kind of so like it. marks on your temple garments. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. You get to choose the... Uh, fabric. Yeah. I'm surprised they didn't rename you because part of the sign of a cult or high demand religion is you get a new name. Well, I was, I was senior Proctor Edmondson. Okay. I did get a new name when okay. I earned the rank of okay. green sash. I was senior Proctor Edmondson. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I did get a new name and Nippy okay. was Proctor Ames. Oh, that's right? how people referred to you In when, the, when you were teaching. Oh, okay. So yeah. you did get a new name. I did get a new name. All right. Yep. Right. And when you were in the construct of the center, you called people by their proctor name or prefect. Okay. Nancy was prefect. Oh. And the highest rank they was did, senior they counselor. Did new names. Senior counselor <laughs> Boone, counselor K. Did they call each other brothers and sisters or in no. the order? Okay. Mm. No. Just checking. All right. I did go on a trip with my girlfriend once and call her my sister wife though, because I enjoyed <laughs> splitting the child care with her. Because those those Mormons yeah, are no. weird. Yeah. Not a <laughs> No. Sorry about that. That's why. It sorry is about weird. that. Um Glass houses. Yeah. Sarah. Yeah. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Totally guilty of that. Um <laughs> Those Mormons are weird. <laughs> I actually had no idea how weird until I interviewed you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, love so, you so much, Marvin. Yeah, <laughs> love, love you, so you love you, love you. Mean it. Um. Anyway, so yeah, we. I said yes to her. I said okay. Like, I'll, and I'll after after a couple of days of humming and hawing and feeling kind of anxious about it, and once I said yes, she's like, okay, now you need to give me more collateral to seal the deal, and, and give our listeners a sense of what was used as collateral. Wait, so yeah, it's just to hear about it. I had to sign a confession about all these things that I had done in my twenties that I wouldn't really want people to know. Yeah, you know, dirt basically. Yeah, good dirt. Dirt. And the first time I wrote it, <clears throat> she took a picture, sent it to someone, and said it's not dirty enough. And I had to, I had to add to it, and and I even said things that weren't true, which, just just to make it worse. But still incriminates you, still even incriminate if, if you're me. lying about yeah. your own history. You're yeah. still incriminates you more. Yeah. Blah 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 blah. <clears throat> to be a full member of DOS, I had to give her a nude photo. So they could. Yeah. Threaten to yes. expose that on the yeah. internet yes. if you ever defect that's, and it. And that's out there somewhere. Yeah. 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 <laughs> This Kara's learning I'm just this. making faces over here. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's shocking. I this know. Is, some of this is new to Kara. Yeah. No. And also Lauren was like, you know, Lauren's my really good friend. We've seen each other naked, yeah. changing, going to yoga, whatever. Like what's a big deal. Yeah. But she was like, I did this. You did this. I'll take, she took a picture for me. I was like, mm, you know, I found out later <laughs> that other women gave like close up vaginal shots yeah, and like little sexy videos and like masturbation videos and yeah. way worse than me. Yeah. Just to get in. I don't know how I got let off so easily, but. You weren't on the inner, inner circle, yeah. but I well, guess you were I'll say that I think Lauren had your back. A little bit. A little bit. No, yeah. I, I think Lauren wanted you in. But also wanted to spare me from Keith. Well, she also knew that she you had your boundaries. So to keep yeah. you in, she had to be a little bit lenient. Yeah, she, she couldn't let me off easy. Like I'm super curious. Did, did Sarah, did you say to Nippy, Lauren's asking for naked photos. No, no, I wasn't no, no, allowed no. to know about no, it. No. See, that's why they have to get between get the couple. Between the relationship. Yeah. They have to yeah. split the couple Yeah, because they needed to groom Sarah without nippy, independent, no. right. uh, Before high I... testosterone, alpha male nippy. We don't want him, you know, messing around. No, so no. we got to split the couple, right? No, but before I even... Um, I had to beat his ass first. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but truthfully, he part of my commitment was obedience and total secrecy. She even said, you cannot tell Nippy. From your own spouse. Yeah. yeah you'll never be able to tell Nippy. You yeah. can tell him that you're 
maybe partnering with some of the upper rank greens, like the high levels that we were and doing some extracurricular stuff for your growth. But I couldn't say what it was. I couldn't say what we were doing. Yeah. And I was like, okay. And truthfully, like because of our normal banter, but also the wedge that was within us, like Nippy didn't never thought that I was like, he loves me in a lot of different ways, I think, and respected me, but also I'm not a tough person. You know, I'm not a strong I'm not a strong, like the first time when he saw me give birth was the first time he was like, respect, you know? <laughs> but up until then, he's like, you know, Sarah does yoga. Like she doesn't work out. She you know? stretches. She stretches. But like, I was like, I'm going to be strong and I'm going to like do something really tough and he's not going to know about Wait, it. So. You're blaming me for this? Yes. No. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Victims. No, but, but, there, but there was a part of me that was like, I'm going to do this and he's not going to know and I'm going to be better wife and I'm going to, yeah. and, like, and I, I was kind of, and there was an excitement to it and yeah. it was like a secret thing. They're choosing you. You're special. I was special and I was a small group of women and da, 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 da. Anyway. So you gave the collateral. I gave the collateral and it turned on a dime pretty quick. It turned to, as soon as I was in, I, then, I, then I found out I had to give new collateral every month for the rest of my life Ugh. to fortify my commitment. The, one of the second or third things that she asked me for, which was one of the things that was I put on the shelf that eventually made the shelf collapse that I woke up, is she asked me for the deed to our home that she would hold just yeah. to make sure that I never strayed from the path. Mm-hmm. I'm going to add a caveat. Yeah. In the trial, it came out in the transcripts that Keith asked Lauren, um, does Sarah know that if she has to do sex, well, favors for me, she knows that this is part of it. And Lauren lied to Keith and said, yes. Sorry, just to clarify that. that. Keith said, does does Sarah know that if you command her to have sex with another man, that she has to do that? And Lauren's lied. Lauren said, yes. She never said said that to me. And this is kind of shaping up as like a sexual pyramid scheme yes, kind of thing. Yes, that's exactly so, what it was. So yeah. think of Keith like, he's pissed he didn't get Sarah, right? Yeah. So this is the whole psychology. It's like, you know, I feel entitled to that. Yeah. I'm the vanguard. I get Alpha male. That. And, you know. The grayback. After I made fun of him at his. Not on purpose, but did, uh, Nippy did an I did an imitation of, of him. him. Right? I feel like, you know, he had it out. And, and we didn't know that he had tried with me right. in the past, but I didn't, I missed the cues. <laughs> Partly because I always found him kind of, eh. And Vanguard's I got mean, no, he's not a no. sexy, no. hot. No. He's like, is he super short? Like yeah. he's short. How yeah. short is like he? Like five, five or something? He's five, like seven? five, seven. Like how does a guy like, you, you just physically, you wouldn't look at the he, guy and say, really he's really good, he's really good at ever. manipulating women and giving them what they want and speaking to them in the way that they want to feel loved yeah. and special. And, and truthfully, Towards the end of my time there, I did feel closer to him. But for many years, I kept him at arm's length yeah. and like distant. I felt uncomfortable around him. So I never got close to him. But also another way that <clears throat> I found out later that he got women in his full, that he wouldn't be like, hey, you want to, he'd be like, I'm starting a new business. And it would be from somebody else. One of his women around him would say, Keith is starting this new thing and thinks that you might be good for it. You should come meet with him. And then you'd meet and you'd talk about the next steps and you go do the next steps. And then you get closer to him. And then he'd say, I think that maybe I could mentor you and you seem like really rigid around relationships. And basically he'd then propose the romantic or the sexual part. I was invited to five different businesses with him, uh, separate from the other stuff we were doing. And I never, they never made any sense to me. So I never, I never bit. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I never got to the next step. He was, he was fishing, but you were biting. Yeah. I also, I had an old girlfriend that I brought to an event and she worked, you know, in commodities previously. And the woman, Pam Kafritz, who was, was kind of like right-hand woman, His pimp. approached my old girlfriend, my girlfriend at the time, and says, Keith heard you're in commodities and he's interested in working with people who are interested in commodities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, I remember thinking, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's no one else besides my girlfriend. And this girl, she's tall, blonde, beautiful, you know. What you want to do is you want to, I mean, I think a lot of times sexual intimacy can follow emotional intimacy. And so what he wants is he doesn't want you and Nippy having emotional intimacy. He wants to find a way to make you feel like he needs your skills. He respects who you are. Mm -hmm. Then he can start working with you, develop the emotional intimacy. And then the sexual intimacy can come after the emotional intimacy Mm -hmm. is developed. That's, that's pretty much what all the women we spoke to said who, who were in his harem and got out. And what's also interesting is we spoke to someone who left in like 2008 or nine who said when she read about DOS, like when we were public about DOS, and she said, that's what our lives were like. She was a harem member, and mm-hmm. she left to pursue her doctorate and like snuck away quietly. She said, 
you know, we were available at all times of the night. We had to answer our phone. We couldn't turn our phones off. We had to be super, super thin because it, being fat affected his energy or some BS. Um, we had to, um, you know, it wasn't called DOS. I didn't use master slave, but basically he had a bunch of women slaves that were attending to his every need. So he just formalized what he'd always done and then put in the collateral blackmail aspect so people would be loyal and never leave. Of course it didn't work because look, here I am. Yeah. And I mean, really they, they, they invited the wrong person. Like, I really don't know what yeah. they were thinking. I just don't know how yeah. they thought it was going to get by me. So talk about, talk about the cauterizing, um, because yeah, I have a question about that, that that involves you, Nippy. So, so that's the part we haven't gotten to yet. That was like the yeah, the and final I'm, collateral. I'm hesitant to like get too into this part of it because no, I still find bit. it super triggering to talk I'm, about yeah, it. And, okay. and and I'm all also okay to just answer, read the book, watch the vow. But ultimately, whatever you're comfortable. Yeah, nothing you. that you're not comfortable. Thank you. With. I was I was invited to what was supposed to be this the ceremony to officially bring me into DOS a couple months after I given the collateral and I flew to Albany. I was also there for another Janesse training. So it, the, everyone was going to be in town anyway. And I was supposed to get this tattoo that was part of like, you know, my commitment, right? I don't have any tattoos for a reason. I, I know that my trends and ideas change. Like I almost got a Wonder Woman tattoo and when I was like early twenties and I'm not in that stage anymore. So I'm like glad I don't have a Wonder Woman tattoo. But Lauren was, had EM'd me. Lauren EM'd me through my fears at like, Tell us what the EM An EM means. is exploration of meaning. So if you have a reaction towards something, you can always get an EM so that meaning doesn't mean that to you anymore. And so she changed my meaning of like something that is sort of like, you know, I don't want to get a tramp stamp, you know, no, this is a, this is a symbol for your growth. Mm -hmm. And this is for you on your body. And it's a, it's a, it's a physical reminder of mm. what, what you're committed to. Yeah. And I could get behind that. And also like I'd taken a vow of obedience. Right. And I had collateral on the line. So everything that we chose to do from that point wasn't really choice. It was coercion because it was a gun to my head of the blackmail. So that's how I explain it. When people are like, why don't you just leave? Why don't you just say no? Because I was being blackmailed from that point on. And it was subtle blackmail. It's not like we're going to release this. If you don't do it, it'd be more like, do you remember your commitment? Yeah. You promised your vow. Yeah. You made a vow. You made a commitment. It's yeah. honor. It's yeah. integrity. Yeah. Trust of course, me. of course, you don't always know what you're getting into when you make the vow, and that's yes. in the Mormon temple ceremony. You're not told what you're covenanting to before you go to the temple. Yeah, you make the covenants while everyone's looking at you, and it's too late. By the time late. you're there to make your covenants, there's no, in, there's no informed consent beforehand. Yeah, yeah. And there's no realistic yeah. way to get out, and, and so you're you're ramrodded into a covenant before you understand what covenant you're actually making, and before you have time to really think through the implications of the covenant you're making. Yes, Is exactly. That right? Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And and she's even reading what sounded like Mormon scripture to me as I lay down on this. And these, these details are like really specifically laid out in the, actually the first chapter of my book, I start there <clears throat> and then I, and then I go backwards. Um, and showing up with my sisters who I, I knew from Nexium, but I've never, uh, wasn't that close with. And then I had to get naked with them, lie on a massage table and the tattoo was on a tattoo, but actually a brand. So no informed consent um, and no explanation of what I was committing to. And then she started reading the scripture, which I was supposed to recite. And she had me say, and this came out in the trial later, where Keith taught the leaders, have them say, master, would you brand me? It would be an honor. So, that it, asked. so it looks consensual. And they yeah. have a recording of this. This is one of the way, ways they were able to get him on sex trafficking, right? Because um, a lot of the women, once they were in, were then tasked with the with the assignment to seduce Keith, of course, to help them with their own control and relationship issues, not for his gratification. So, um, yeah, he wasn't enjoying it. No, he wasn't enjoying it. Um, mm. it's a, the, the whole night is crazy. It was a couple of hours when we first saw it, the first person who lay down on the table, it looked like she was being electrocuted. She was flipping around and crying and her skin was being seared open by a cauterizing iron, um, in the, and a symbol right in the bikini line, like right next, like, right on the pelvis, like an inch away from someone's pubic line, essentially. Um, and I was trying to figure out like, could I get out of there? You know, I was gaslighting myself. Like you said that you were gonna do this and now you're backing out and this is, you know, Keith said this is what, what women do. They back out and they, they have no integrity, they have no honor. You have to do it. And you're under the collaterals on the line. And also I even pulled Lauren aside at one point and she said, you're a green sash. I was the highest rank in the room other than her. You know, these women are looking up to you. 
And I and also another sidebar is that Lauren was the person that controlled any promotion in the company. So it's like the any situation where someone's like with a higher rank and they, if they don't do the thing, it's like their career is at stake. That was my career. I know that if I didn't show toughness and push through and make this thing happen, that I wouldn't get to get to the next level, which I don't care about now, obviously, but in that world, that was everything. Um, so I lay down on the table and I breathe deeply. And I, what I now know from trauma therapy is that I disassociated. I left my body and I, and I lay really, I saw that the women who, the, the more still you were, the easier it would be. And Lauren even testified in court that I, I did really well because I, I lay still. I did my deep breathing from yoga and I peaced out and I got through it, but it was horrific pain. There was no anesthetic. That was the point. Go through something painful, be a strong ass bitch and, um, be part of this boot camp where these women could do anything and build the character that we needed to build as men had. So I was proud of myself and I felt good about it. And I was in a total state of trauma and elation that I'd gone through it. And Lauren was there afterwards whispering in my ear and hugging me and cooing. And we were all laughing and smiling and trying to make light of this awkward situation being in a room with six sweaty naked women that we didn't know that well. It was weird. I mean, it was a totally crazy, weird event, and I can't believe I'm still <laughs> talking about it, but, like, that's what happened. And it wasn't till about six weeks later that I figured out that the symbol was not a symbol for the elements, as I'd been taught, but it was it was Keith's initials in a cryptic monogram. And? And, and maybe, we don't know this for sure, Alice and Max. Is that what you're talking about? We don't know that. Okay. Uh, we, yeah, we, we, we think that. But we don't know that for sure. And she's an actress that she's, was on was Small one, World. Smallville, yeah. Smallville. She, she yeah. was one of the the top women in DOS. We don't know that for sure. It's never been verified. Okay. But at the time, I was like, oh, my God, I have Alice and Max initials and Kate Turner initials on my body. And, and that was ultimately what woke me up. But it was a series of things that happened up until then, you know, asking for the deed to my home, doing the branding, um, you know. As, and as soon as I committed, I, I was being asked to recruit other people for this and – you know, it, it all happened very, very quickly. And then I was out very quickly. So it wasn't, a, it was a matter of months that I was in DOS. Part of the perverse um, logic or strategy of putting members through super brutal, inhumane experiences is ironically, when you put them through something brutal, uh, they end up feeling proud of themselves that they went through something super hard, yes. like a Mormon mission, like pioneers crossing the plains. Yeah. You put them through enough adversity, they're proud of themselves that they went through it, and then they're ironically, even though it's the organization causing the pain, they feel more bonded to the organization because they they overcame the pain and did something very difficult. Mm -hmm. mm. And the elevation emotion can follow the pain that the organization inflicted on you. Yeah. And it sounded like it worked for a lot of them, and it worked for you maybe temporarily, mm -hmm. but not... But with you, they, they picked the wrong person. <laughs> yeah. I said in one of my first public interviews, they effed with the wrong person. Like, I, don't, I really don't know what they were thinking because I, I, di I was not so isolated. I didn't live in Albany. I had a community and friends and family outside of it. And, and also at the same time, don't forget, Mark Vicente was waking up because his wife, Bonnie, had left. And yeah. he was my, other than Nippy, he was, I called him my bonus husband mm -hmm. in the company. Like we were really, really close. He's my business partner and he was questioning and he helped me question and he knew certain things that I didn't. We'd all been so siloed. We yeah. all had separate yep. information, right? Yep. So once we finally talked for the first time, he, he made me sign an NDA before I could even talk to him as he was leaving. Yeah. And those conversations are what, what woke us up. And then Nippy members, said, members talking to each other. Yeah. 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 Not being allowed to share information was really because any concern I ever had, if I went down line, it was not, it's not appropriate leadership. And if I went up line, I was always gaslit. So you guys may or may not want to talk about this, but this is one of the big questions. You know, like just the audacity of having women be branded just mm -hmm. blows my mind, even married women. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Joseph Smith had at least 10 polygamous wives that were married to other men at the time. That's called polyandry, where the woman has multiple husbands. Mm -hmm. But we think Joseph used that as a cover. Mm. Um, because, oh, she's married. You know what right. I mean? Right. Anyway, how the audacity of the branding in and of itself is mind boggling, but he had to have known that at some point Nippy's going to see this. And how is he in the world? How did he ever imagine that Nippy, number one, were you going to hide this from Nippy? And then secondly, like, did you even, 
did you wonder? Because Nippy didn't know. You didn't know she was doing this before she did it, which is also mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. But then how did Keith and Lauren imagine that conversation was going to go when Nippy found out? Well, we were trained. So in my I have no idea in my group, that. honestly, he's just delusional. But in my group of women, myself and a woman named Jimena from Mexico, were the first married women to get branded. Other than that, all the other women were single. Yeah, and um, and and or with Keith. <laughs> so the first group of people were all his lovers. Yeah, and then the second tier was some single people and some married people. So we were we were experiments. And Lauren was like, just try to keep it from him as long as you can. So when he does see it. She was telling you to keep it from yeah. Nippy for as long as yes. you can. Yes. And I did. I kept it for about six weeks because we were into separate cities. Six weeks. Well, I was we, out of town. He was out of town. And then we were in separate beds because I was trying to. Because Troy was trying to get Troy off. I was off. trying to wean Troy at this point. So I was, we were like, kept right. It was like a bed, musical beds. And, Troy was our two-year-old. And time. like, I'd walk, if I was wearing underwear, you couldn't see it. So I was still like, I'd get out of the shower, the towel around me. He wouldn't see it. And in sex, it's dark. Yeah. Right. Well, truthfully, there wasn't a lot of that because we were in separate so, cities and I was weaning a baby. Yeah. yeah so, okay, okay. you know, that was so, and, and, or dark, but either way he didn't see it. And, um, and she said, just keep it. So he will never associate this with Albany. And if he does see it, the, I was supposed to say something like, that a group of us got together, we did this thing to experience pain and that we would grow and it's just a little commitment to my growth. Like basically a modified version of what we did, not telling him everything, never got to that point. And I think they weren't ever gonna reveal that it was his initials. Yeah, like they, that, and that's really like cut to- But still. Yeah. No, yeah. Hey, here's, <laughs> let me, if she had come back with a mark on her elbow, I would've been up there with a the baseball bat. You're not gonna mark my wife with anything Yeah. to teach her character, growth, whatever that you think you're teaching my wife. Yeah. And it's not your job to do that. Yeah. that That's where this ends. And, you know, a lot of people are like, how did you let this happen? No, we happened to Keith Ranieri. We happened to him. That That's where the line was going to get dropped. And, I, and look. What do you mean by that? Meaning. We ended it. We ended it. It wasn't like it happened to him. Oh, we happened brought, to him. brought it to him. We, you know, this is where it stops. This is where the abuse stops. And one way or the other, it was going to be the end of Keith Raniere. Sure. Whether it was going to be legally yeah. or it was going to be me going in there and doing, doing something about it. That's what I had decided. I had tacitly decided that. I didn't tell Mark. I didn't tell Sarah. And there was a point where, because I found out over the phone, I was going to go take matters into my own hand. And there was a point where I was like going to drive up there because I knew where he was. And Wait, I, can you talk about when you found out and how you found so out? If, I you, was, if you're comfortable. Yeah. I was in my car on 37th <laughs> and 6th Avenue. I get a call from Mark because she's still in Vancouver. I'm in New York. Um, my friend Eduardo is sitting shotgun to me, who incidentally is still loyal and still defending him. To Keith. To Keith. Yeah. And I get on the phone with Mark. He tells me, because she was afraid to tell me. Um, and I didn't, I was like, what? I was, I was like, hold on a sec. Let's just. Mark told you? Mark told me. I, was like, I asked I was, him to tell. I was like, hold on a sec. After you guys were starting to defect? Yes, this is, I defected it's, this first. This is unraveling. And yeah. I'm like, hold on a second. I said, he used to tell because I didn't want to break my vow of secrecy. I was that afraid. But I knew if Mark told him. At I, first, I'm like, hold on a sense. second. Hold on a second. What? Wait, when? When did this happen? Like, what, what? When was this going? And I'm starting to do the math on all the abuses I had heard about. And I'm like, okay, well, this is over. Because Mark had also resigned two weeks earlier. How did it feel to you? Like, I imagine if this had happened to Margie, <clears throat> I'd be mad at Keith, but there would be a part of me that would feel like she betrayed me by doing it without telling me and then by hiding it from me. I understood it. Really? I understood, I, 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 I understood how it happened and the indoctrination. I also know my wife. Like, um, There was one moment when we were all out where I was kind of pissed. You know, it was like, you know, we're five days at out. Her, at her? At, at, when we were in Toronto and I was like, you know, we had a fight. I didn't think we were going to make it. Well, it was moment. a fight. Like, how did you let this happen? Blah, 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 blah. But that, but you have to understand there was that I was, I had problems with the organization for a long time. 
And the reason I was staying is because I thought I was turning my back on my principles. Like right? you left. Yeah. The, the, the principles of why I was staying, all the things that I was doing was why I hadn't left in the first place. There was enough things in the organization before that that I didn't like and I didn't want to, you know, I was done. I didn't like this didn't work. So there's two things that went on. I was pissed it happened, physical pain to my wife. Also, I wasn't able to protect her. Um, pissed I didn't see it, right? And yourself. Put, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd put it on all this time and relieved I could leave now. Mm, yeah. Right? Whoa. All the things yeah. that like, you, you don't have the you don't have the moral hold on me anymore. Yeah. You did now cross I can, the line. Now I can now I can everything I was feeling and everything that was going on with me was justified. I was right. My instincts were right. And Nippy was back. I if that makes that. sense. Ooh, I love that. Does that make that. sense? And uh, and I was I, I love that. I Nippy wanted to go back. I wanted to go of course even the score in yeah. a primitive way. Yeah. Just like he says, we're primitive. I was like, you're about to see how primitive I can be, <laughs> right? Um, and so I got talked off the cliff, obviously. Homeboy next to me, Eduardo, just- Can I just say, can I say one quick thing? Yeah. Just like, yeah. you know the metaphor of like, put a bunch of frogs in the, in the yes. water yeah. and, then, and then you turn it up? Like, yes, you weren't always engaged. Yes, you weren't always in. You know, yes, you brought it to him later. But you guys were subtly groomed down a, a yeah. soft path yeah. as the water got turned up more and Absolutely. more and more. And at some point the water got to boiling and you guys were the lucky ones or the yeah. courageous ones or the smart ones or whatever, where you got out. Whatever you want to call but us. The, he took, yeah. he, he took you guys yeah. way far down the path. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, and I don't say that to shame you. I we don't are feel that. all, I don't feel I don't shame. Feel we are all. all of our listeners. It, it's happened to all of us. It I don't feel that way at all. To millions of people yeah. all over the world every day. You know I what I mean? I don't feel I, shame we, at we all felt, I felt that way a little bit when we were out maybe. for a handful of months. But once I see that this is a process that goes on everywhere yeah, with, with all belief systems, no matter how you think you're not susceptible to it or vulnerable yeah. to it, yep. you are, yeah. you just don't know how yet. Yep. And it's to a certain degree. So once yep. I've, once, you know, that all happened, then, you know, cooler heads prevailed. I went in and, you know, it's, it's in the valve where I go in and I shake some limbs, mm -hmm. you know, I yell and, do my official complaint to human resources. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, you know, I just got my wife and kid as far as I could out of there. And then I tried to make a scene. I tried to, you know, flip some tables and I told all my friends that I could, that, you know, this is bad. I was loud about it as much as I could, consistent with what they were going to say my personality was. And we were, we got out of harm's, harm's way physically. And then the drama starts. So really quick, this is a really important part of high demand religions and organizations. What do they do? How do they treat defectors? How do they treat apostates? Well, right? Attack yeah. our character. Yeah. Well, what? But, Attack our character. First thing yeah. first. But we had learned as we were waking up that you, I mean, we knew that people had left over the years. If you left on good terms, you wouldn't be, you, you wouldn't be attacked, but you'd be labeled as, oh, it's too bad the so-and-so never worked through their issues and I guess they're going to bump up against that in their life and they weren't strong enough to continue, essentially. They're blamed. Yeah, blame blamed. reversal of being weak. And yes. They left because they're weak or yes. broken. We're acting yes. out of fear. You know, acting out of fear. Not yeah. love. And yeah. But we also <laughs> knew that anyone who left on bad terms would be sued. So we were trying to leave on good terms whilst also bringing as many people as we could and trying to share. So we were kind of living a double life for a couple of weeks which was the most scary time of my life. Cause on one hand I was like, Lauren, you know, Nippy now knows about the brand and I went, and, and Nippy, we, this was our strategy. Like he's really upset and like, I got to save my marriage. I'm thinking I'm going to take a step back and I love you and everything's good, but like, I got to pull back. And you're, this, kind of, you're trying to take care of her feelings. Yes. Don't be hurt, Lauren. Yeah, I love you, Lauren. My marriage blah, is blah, falling blah. apart, marriage but don't be apart. mad. Yeah, don't cause be. I wanted them to think that I was choosing my marriage out of like weakness. Cause that would give, give like, I'd rather <laughs> that they thought I was weak than I was being a ballsy defector and yeah. destroying the company. Yeah. So I was like, yeah. I'm you don't want to show your cards. They don't want to show my cards. Yeah. So we were doing a double standard, double standard, a double life for a, a little while. And also trying to tell everyone, we knew there was a training happening shortly where people were flying from around the world to do the next round of branding. And we just wanted that to stop. So, yeah, I was on, so we stopped that. We stopped all except for one group. Uh, who went did it anyway. And they went and did it anyway after I went in and made a scene. Yeah. Yeah. 
Because they were like determined to keep going. But anyway, the- but see, that's that that's what Keith learned from day one. You can have a catastrophe, it can have it all unravel and blow up, mm-hmm. and then you just dust yourself up and you keep going. The, the arrogance. The really successful ones know to never quit. Yeah. Yes. And that's how it always ends with Joseph Smith. By 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 eighteen forty four, Joseph Smith has himself declared king of the world. <laughs> right? King of the world. I'm not joking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's got this the, a, a legion, a Nauvoo legion larger than than like any standing domestic US army and he's parading his legion around from town to town having had himself crowned king of the world while he was running for president of the United States. That's that's where Joseph Smith got as things were. So it's just the hubris, just you the double hubris. down, you double down. There's this exponential curve of hubris. Genghis Khan. Yeah. I think I mentioned <laughs> yeah. this in my interview when you were on our podcast that I read something, I think it was under the, under the banner of heaven when I was mm-hmm. educating myself. That's a good, yeah. It's such a good book. Um, show notes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Cares on it. Cares all over it. That there was a theory that when you lie to the level that Keith Renier was lying, Joe Smith was lying, um, and living a, um, like this double life of like, oh, I'm this person, but really I'm a polyamorous douchebag, you know, like, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's this, that, that, that like fuels this sort of like fuel. The theory was that it fuels libido yeah. as well. That the I lying, so. yeah. the, the lying adrenaline, the, the adrenaline and the like excitement of that was f- fueling the libido. And that sort of like was a self-perpetuating cycle. I just think that's interesting. I think that's true. I think you could do a whole doctorate on that. But anyway, just to wrap up so what I happened. So lie to get my libido up? Is that what you're saying? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Complica- complicate things wig. a little more for me. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, we, we got out. We, we brought a lot of people with us. And a lot of people left because especially in Vancouver, many of them never met Keith and Nancy. Can I just say, yeah. can I ask one thing? Yeah. How many people before you had tried quietly went away and oh. I'm thinking about in Mormonism, how many Mormons realize that they're going to face, they're going to reap the whirlwind if they speak up and speak out. And so they either stay in quietly or they just try and fade away quietly, but they, but they feel too afraid to lift their voices and I, I don't, that, that it, a lot of this is privilege, but I really do have mad respect for people that choose the path of speaking publicly, knowing that it's going to come at a deep personal cost. What was it about you guys that either gave you the privilege to be able to do that or mm-hmm. gave you the courage to do that when so many people who follow high demand religions just stay quiet and and fear reaping the whirlwind. A couple of things. First of all, I don't know how many people because I'm not in touch with all of them, but I know that many people have come to me since saying I left, not even knowing what you know now, but just things were weird and I didn't want to cause a it. thing. They felt it. They want to cause a scene. And But I'm talking about raising your voice. No, no, well, not, not many people did, but the people that did in 2009, a bunch of people left, oh, nine yeah. women left. They faced litigation. But they made the mistake of trying to solve things internally first and yeah. trying to resolve things with Keith and they talk it they out. They didn't know they were lo- what they were dealing with. They didn't like that he they'd figured out that he was sleeping with people. They didn't realize he was a sociopath. They didn't realize what he was willing to do. And by the time they'd hashed it all out, he gaslit them so much, they looked crazy. Yeah. And they were. like I mean, I know I felt super wacky, whacked out, like an almost nervous breakdown when I was leaving. These women were not in a good place. So I didn't trust them mm-hmm. when they were like, Keith is good. And I'd be like, okay. And they didn't have do, the resources to... Go do your thing, right? Yeah. So they left, right? And then you, this is now 2009. So let me do the math. Eight years later, mm-hmm. when we're waking up yeah. and we're going, oh, that's what they were dealing with, you know? And then, so we knew we weren't going to try to resolve it internally. Yeah. We, no, we, I was, we, yeah. we were out and we went through stages of like, first we got to get out. Well, that, that's we the other thing. Seek safety. Everything that we had heard previously about Keith's wake that had been denied immediately became true to me. Yeah. It wasn't a smear campaign. Like true. And then, then some. It was, it was, it wasn't blasphemy. It was true. And that happened very quickly. And so in to answer your question, we first we need to like get out and be safe, and then we realized we had tons of friends that were literally slaves. And I, for me specifically, because I'd been a recruiter for so long, some of those women were there because of me, and were way further deep because of me because I told <clears throat> them to, that this was a good thing. So I I knew I couldn't be quiet. I knew that I had to go loudly, and and 
destroy it. I didn't. Same. Yeah, it was. It was. Pre- that was pretty quick. Also, listen. Are you saying because you felt responsible yeah. for having recruited so yeah. many people, There's you that. felt like you needed to be a whistleblower? Yeah, absolutely. To get them out. I think you say yeah. that in the vow. Yeah. It's like we get, we we got them in. We can get them out. We can get yes. them out. Right? Yeah, I have to. And, do that. I'm not yeah. just leave them there. What allows yeah. abuse to exist is cowardice. Yeah. And I'll, yeah, right? up, I mean, up look until at then. look at. I mean, yeah. you can call it the American indoctrination or whatever. Like. I've the reason I got involved with the organization is because I had a problem with that existing in the world. So I would be nothing to myself, right? If I didn't do something about it, the first thing was get my, get my family out of there. And then what's the fight? Yeah. What does it look like? Mm -hmm. And fortunately, you know, it didn't look like previous people who left fortunately, you know, and here's one of the things I was betting on, you know, large on, I was pretty confident as a guy whose wife got branded with another man's initials, those optics didn't look good for them. And when the cards were on the table, they were the ones that were going to be incriminating looking more so than a guy having a problem with what happened to his wife and reacting to it. I was pretty confident that our culture would support that over, Oh, Nope, she chose it, and your reaction's the problem to another man's initials in your pubic area. And the character and growth thing apply. None of the optics look good for them. And, and that bet turned out to be way more true than I anticipated, right? We didn't know. We, we, you know. What we whistle blew on was like 10% of what ended up being true. It was like superficial. Way more. What, like the, what came the, out in the trial? Was. What was worse than what you just described? Pedophilia, oh. rape. Like his, his, Having his wake and his, the things that we exposed were manipulating like, so many more people. Financial, you know. Yeah. Financial drain. All the stuff. I mean, how much did the Bronfins lose to his commodities experiment? $65 million were, were lost. That the Bronfins gave the to him. Money. Like ma- massive I'm not massive so sure it was lost. I think it's somewhere to be honest like with you. Like probably in a crypto account somewhere. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah, it, it was the right thing for us to do a hundred percent. And you know, like not everybody wanted us to do that. Like my family was so happy to have me back and awake and all those things. And then I was like, I have to do this. And they were like, are you sure? <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know, and we didn't know, we didn't know it was going to happen. We didn't know it was going to be so obvious once it was all in, in try, like all came out in court and people were testifying. It, it was a blowout. It was a blowout. It wasn't even, a, it wasn't even a close fight, but we didn't know that at the time. Right. And we, they also had, ammo they had a big litigation machine and we didn't know you know how and what it was going to look like and then when when claire bronfman gets on a jet a month later to fly out and try and have my wife arrested the arrogance the i it just enraged me to get a lawyer to like you know know, so then we go to the new york times and you know i wasn't didn't really want to go to new york times but we went to the new york times and then then everything they dragged us into a fight that they lost it Big could time. Have, it could, I mean, they could have handled it internally. Yeah. They could. They could have called. Like, no. Nancy never even called me. Lauren not, never even called me. Well, not course, for me. I wasn't no. in a place to like that, be gaslit and be you know talked off a ledge. But that was a hard thing for me, like because I was closer to some of those people, and to like lose all these friendships in a in a heartbeat was really yeah. hard. I'm still a struggle with that. I don't. Well, why so? Why so? It was my community. I really miss they, them. They took a swipe at our character and my family and things. But there's some good people in there, you know? Yeah. But see that, I think that's like, if I had to reduce the grit Mormonism has on people to one thing, it would be community. Mm-hmm. I, I really do yeah. think, and yeah. it's so, it's so powerful that that's, you're kind of getting teary eyed a little yeah. bit and that's, that's what made it hard for you yeah. to raise your voice. I walked away from a lot of people that I cared about a lot and I knew there was going to be collateral damage. But it had to be done. And what'd you lose? I mean, honestly, I lost all of them except for a handful. And I have a very small circle now, and I'm I'm okay with that. But it's I've always been the kind of person to seek closure, and I still don't have closure with a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Only recently, I had closure closure with Lauren when she got sentenced, and she wrote me an apology letter, which kind of ended that for me. And I still would like to see her and talk to her at some point down the road. When she, when we're allowed, we're currently, we're not allowed to, and it be, feels differently, but you know, I, you know, with Lauren, it's, it's different, but I, I really believe when people take a run at your character, they take a run at your thing. I, 
I think you can wish him well, but I think it's dangerous to let him back in your life. Yeah. I really do. I mean, maybe it's different with Lauren because I think Lauren has kind of had the same experience that we've had and she can understand it and we can have that conversation. It seems that way from what I've seen. Lauren is the only one I kind of hold that out for. The rest, I just, even how they're talking and how they take, you know, Sarah, Sarah doesn't, Sarah is the target of a lot of them because I think Sarah demonstrated the character they none of them have. And that's hard for them to, to really, um, get their heads around. They don't want to see the fact that Sarah was right. She did a hard thing. She went through a hard thing and none of them had the, had the balls to do it. And they have to see that every day. Yeah. And see Sarah winning in a ways that they're losing and they're not willing to take that in. Yeah. Jumping back to the community thing for just one second. Mm -hmm. um, it is such a powerful binding force. And when I watched Wild Wild Country, which is a documentary yes. I, I hope everyone will watch on Netflix. I mentioned it in my speech. Very now. good. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Karen, you can add that to the show notes if you want. Um, the guy, and this was true in Holy Hell, which was another yep. documentary on Netflix. That. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what you hear these people saying is, it was the happiest time of my life. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was terrible and horrible and awful. It was a cult, and I, I'm glad I got out. And... I don't know that I've ever been happier. So there's something about, and you feel like at the time, did you feel like these were your true family? This yeah. was your true family. Chosen family. I, I never family. felt that way. Yeah, Nippy, you did, didn't. Nippy didn't as much. But, I, I did. I did. What did you feel about, you felt what about this community? That they were what? That they were, that we're all on the same path and that we really understood each other and we were sharing our lives in a vulnerable way and that we had a connection that nobody else would understand. And that bond was what? I mean, it was glue. It was glue. It, it, it also, the, belt fought, the bond felt like it was what? It felt like it was, the bond felt like it was glue for everything. And, yeah. and, and truthfully, even more so my community in Vancouver, a lot of the people in New York weren't, I didn't relate to as much, but basically I brought all my friends yeah. that I had fr were friends before even. Yeah. And we made this little thing that we did together. And it was, and I didn't, it's like we showed up three times a week, like church, you know, we were consistent. There were a lot of people in it truthfully that I wasn't that close with. I'm going to, and I didn't really yeah. see that. Until yeah, but you brought, I mean, it'd be akin to me going back to Atlanta and bringing all my childhood that's, buddies. That's why Nippy didn't that's have why the I same didn't, thing. Like, yeah. I, was, I had know. my buddies in it. Yeah. Um, but the people who were different than me, a lot of the people in Albany, I actually didn't like. Sure. So, But I kept them at a distance. But the community that I did like, the part that I built in Vancouver, I was very attached to. There's this thing called Dunbar's number that no human can have more like an 150 deep, meaningful connection. Yeah. So yeah. you don't need more than right. 100, 150 total. Yeah. But the point that I'm trying to make is, we're, we're, there's a saying, a lone monkey is a dead monkey. Mm -hmm. We yeah. are tribal. Yes. We sure. are, have evolved to be tribal. Yep. So what we're all seeking is this deep, rich, powerful, meaningful, meaningful tight knit yep. community. And that's what you were seeking. And mm -hmm. that's what you ironically obtained. Mm -hmm. But the, <clears throat> the chemicals in your brain feel so amazing when you're in it. That it's like this, and Joseph Smith was seeking for Zion. He called it Zion. Mm -hmm. Someday we're going to be in the Zionic state where, where there's no poor among us and everybody loves each other and we're all, and that's what these cults mm -hmm. generate ironically. Mm -hmm. And when you're in it, the chemicals in your brain are so amazing. It's like meth or heroin, I'm sure of it. Same chemical processes. Mm -hmm. But you also believe that these people are your homies. They're my real family, and they'll be to, they'll be with me to the bitter end. Mm -hmm. And then, as soon as you step out, I can tell you what happened to me when mm -hmm. I got excommunicated. What what happens to those relationships when you step out of that community that you thought was heaven on earth? Right? What yeah. happens to those relationships? Well, I mean. Because I was a defector, anyone who was still a believer wouldn't speak to me, and they shunned me. Yeah, they would. They would. They cut communication. The word yep. spread very quickly that I was telling people about the brand and that I was not to be trusted, and I was a suppressive. And there's all sorts of rumors. One of them was that I didn't get promoted to the executive because they couldn't tell people, like they couldn't tell the community at large that I'd been branded. You left DOS, <laughs> and I left DOS. So they made up a bunch of rumors, like I was part of the executive. I wanted to be on the executive board, and I didn't get promoted. And I was having a tantrum, like women do when they don't get what they want, <laughs> like all this terrible thing. Um, or that Nippy was upset, and I was going to choose him over the company because I was so dependent, and 
you know, blah, blah, blah. It's always blame reversal. When, yeah, when, you, when reversal. you defect, you did something yeah. wrong. You're the bad person. You're defective. Yeah. Yeah. Stay away. They're dangerous. High demand religions and cults have to demonize the defectors. Yeah. Defectors are by far always the most dangerous yeah. force. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even people who are well, out now. I still had some people that were talking to me. I, mean, I had enough. I'd say there's about five to 10 people that the buddies that I had that were like playing both sides. They come to me, they go here. And then ultimately their process was like, I believe nippy. And one of them was like, listen, Claire came to me. Bronfman came to me and was like, okay, what dirt do you have on them? So this is what I knew that like, you know, they're willing to do anything. Yeah. And there's even yeah. people that have since left and it took them a while, like much longer after we left, who don't who who don't support Keith anymore. Like they don't think Keith is good, but they still won't speak to us because they think what we did was bad. Because they didn't like the way we handled it. They didn't, they didn't like how we handled it. They thought we could have handled it internally, which my means they don't really is, get it. You don't get to tell me how I defend my family. Yeah. So the, there's, you know, we, we still get calls. People apologize, you know, say, Hey, sorry, we didn't believe you. I'm sorry. I never reached out, but sorry I was told that. that, yeah, I was told, sorry about that. That's our family motto. Um, and we still get those calls and I'm sure we'll continue to, but there's other people who will never call us because. Well, they weren't our friends anyway. Yeah. That was, yeah. I don't care. They weren't our friends. Anyway. But they but felt the, like they were. They, yeah. They, yeah. I mean, they were, some of them were at They're our wedding. Allies. They were allies. Yeah. You know, under a false premise. But it also, luckily, we when we left, we left with enough people that we had a little community. So there's enough pe yeah. yeah there was Mark, enough people. Bonnie. There's 20 to 30 people that were we, helping we, us take we, it down, we writing little, letters uh, to the credit card company. Like, writing, like, yeah, all one these of the letters. things that we did, we found out later was a big demise of the company is that we encourage people who are on, because we have monthly payments towards the like, you know, the, the monthly commitment. It's like 300 bucks a month. Um, to call their credit card company and say that they didn't want to do it anymore and that the company was fraudulent, which it was. And so when you have enough what's called a what, – what's it called? A chargeback. When you, when you say to, to Visa, I don't, this is fraud, charge it back. When you have enough chargebacks, the same company, they freeze your accounts. Yeah. Freeze your account. So that was one <laughs> of the things. Hit them in the pocketbook. Yeah, we yep. hit them in the pocketbook. And they weren't able to get access to their funds, and people were defecting. And we – part of our strategy they was to give them chaos. lots of f fires to put out. We, we were putting up, we were giving them fires everywhere and they couldn't handle it. And yeah, know. it's, it's, uh, we won. It's one thing to create a cult or high demand religion before the printing press, which was probably the best time, mm -hmm. you know, pre 1500s to create mm -hmm. a cult or high demand religion. And then Joseph Smith made the mistake of creating a high demand religion after the printing press, because so much got written down. And like Mark, he wanted everything recorded, mm -hmm. which by the way is what partly what blew me away about right. the bow is how many audio recordings and video recordings existed so that there was evidence for everything you're talking right. about. This is demise. The so evidence the is everywhere. The printing press was to Joe Smith what the internet was. Exactly, and I was gonna say that. It's yeah. even worse yeah. to try and create a cult in the internet age where everybody's yeah. got a cell phone and, and texting you, you know, it shows all these texts yeah. you guys are sharing, you know, Skyping each other, communicating across country yeah. and then harnessing we had the social media and, and everything. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a hard time to, yeah. to start a cult these days. And <laughs> I know? mean, in a lot of ways that laid out what the FBI and the DOJ was going to just do. You just handed us a case. Yeah. And we did, yeah. we did like we, Catherine had had all the screenshots, everything yeah. that was proving all these things. And we gave it to the DOJ saying, this is sex trafficking. This is, you know, and obviously they did way more investigation than that, but they had a great starting point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when we yeah. learned, Sarah didn't even have to testify at the trial. That's how, that's, that's how, how much more, that's how egregious his behaviors were. Yeah, that's as just the hubris. Yeah. It's yeah. hubris. Like they could have thrown our situation away yeah. and put him away. Yeah. You know, but, but it's still mind blowing. Yeah. And uh, I remember part of the suspense of the vow is just like, are the cops going to pick this up? Because there's, there's such emphasis in the United States on protection of religious freedom mm -hmm. and Scientology and, and, you know, Joe's witnesses and probably Keith and even Mormonism that so many high demand religions hide behind religious freedom where like politicians and, and law enforcement, they tend to want to stay. And yeah. sometimes even the media, like if it weren't for the branding I don't know that this story would have even been picked up. I was going to say that up. a while back when we were talking about the branding. You know, obviously I wish it hadn't happened to me, but it it's kind of what needed to happen in order to take him down. Because up until then, all of the abuses, and the, like when the women left in 2009, it was really hard to prove. 
Now I have the mark on my body and I can say that this happened, whether I chose it or not, whether I asked for it or not, it didn't matter. Keith was putting his initials on women's bodies like pimps do to their women and like farmers do to cattle. Not okay. There's no place this is ever okay, ever, ever. And they were going, well, it's just like a sorority. They're, that's what they're saying <laughs> they seek now. They to minimize the abuse. Yeah, right like now there's can't. still people who are loyal to it. And they're saying, these are just like a sorority and women are committing. With no, it's not like a sorority because the sorority is for women. This is a men's, a men's sex trafficking ring where yeah, he's putting yeah. his initials in their body. It's not just like a sorority. Yeah. Yeah. And I want, I want to be really careful how I talk about this, Sarah. And I want, I hope you can feel what I'm saying here because I, I live in a world where Mormonism is kind of like a nice cult Yeah, because we've, we've had 150 years to mature. Yeah. So we've stopped doing a lot of the stuff that the, frankly, the government forced us to stop doing. And we changed our image to become like Donny Osmond, Steve mm -hmm. Young, like quarterbacks and entertainers. And we're IBM salesmen, white, you know, clean cut mm -hmm. young Mormon missionaries. What's wrong with that? You know, in some ways, Mormonism has become the all American religion, yes. right? Right. And we're not branding people. We're not like uh, David Miscovich, who's like mm -hmm. a, literally incarcerating people against mm -hmm. their will. And his wife disappeared 10 years ago. And where is she? But mm -hmm. nobody knows. That's like crazy. Mormonism isn't that. And so, you know, you will have these situations where like LGBT people, we're not branding people. But then we've got thousands and thousands and thousands of LGBTQ Mormons that have ended their lives. It's awful. Daily, weekly. And the government's like, oh, well, you know, we've done the sex cult thing. Oh, yeah, we don't really want to cover that. And oh, yeah, we've done the like fraudulent oh, financials. You know, none of those news stories bite. Oh, there's no branding. And so like, but, but there, but branding is horrific and there are emotional and psychological and intellectual brands For that sure. are as bad or sometimes are even worse. And I would, so, so I think you would agree that the, yeah. that the physical brands were not the worst right. thing no. that so, Keith Renary did. This is what right? I've said for the physical brands are the physical manifestation of the emotional abuse. Exactly. And that's the entry point into the emotional abuse. And the emotional abuses are very hard to quantify because there's kind of a plausible deniability of it. Yeah. There's not a there's not a modality. There's not a, a, a physical a, manifestation a, a thing. And, yeah. and and are you going to take that on to prove it? Are you an expert in that? Are legal experts, which are like, I can only take on what I can prove. Am I going to prove feelings? Am I going to prove yeah. emotions? Those yeah. are very difficult things to take on. And there's not an incentive right now in our culture to solve those problems yet. Not only that, there's a disincentive because yeah. as soon as you start getting into that territory, it's like religious freedom. You wait, this is first amendment. You can't impringe on our right. first amendment rights. That's like, that's bad. I and think, so religions, yeah. they're tax exempt. They amass all this wealth and power. Right. And there's all this psychological, emotional abuse, misogyny, racism, sexism, homophobia, and there's destroyed families. There's all this collateral damage in the wake, but because it's a religion, that, that's, uh, that's stay where, away. That's stay where away. you have to go in on. And I think, I, I think it was Mike Rinder, Mike Grinder, who Mike said on, Grinder, uh, yeah. on, on our podcast that, that he was like, Keith really screwed himself by not making himself a religion because he would have been protected, <laughs> you know, and I'm so glad <laughs> that he did it. That's so dark. Yeah. It is you know dark. what I mean? It, yeah. I'm really glad I'm, that, that he didn't because it he was dark. able to be prosecuted and, um, I don't, there's gotta be a way around that. I don't know what it is. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a well, lawyer. this is it. Yeah, we're starting to talk about it, getting the right people. You have to have language. Shining to, light, and... you know, on, on these abuses and the fact that that's happening and no one's willing to do anything about it. That's horrific. That's egregious. And and just like, you know, Gerardo was talking about, and a, a family, I'll just say a family member saying, hey, Gerardo, who's an active, devout, believing Mormon. Hey, Gerardo, check out this weird Nexium cult that's going on. As, a, as an Orthodox Mormon that believes in Joseph Smith and somehow doesn't draw the connection. Okay. It's like we, yeah. we you know, it's, it's, we're all so, in our silos yeah. and we need to break out of our silos, which is why I work with, try and work with Lee and Mike and JT and Lady yeah. C of the Jehovah's Witnesses and Chris Shelton and Lloyd Evans and you guys. We have to work together. To one cross of, promote awareness, for sure, right? For sure. Can we pause and what, and start one, to so bad? One okay, last, yeah. One, yeah, one last comment. Okay. One of the things, and I said this in one of our podcasts, it's like when you're in one of these groups, it's very easy to spot another one, right? Because yeah. we, when we were in these things, 
we 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 were we, when we were in ESP. We'd be like, that's a fucking that's a cult. We'd be looking what at what was a, a cult to you while you were Scientology. In ESP. Scientology, but I didn't really understand why. <laughs> I didn't, but but also like I remember going clear came out and I didn't watch it because someone told me that it was really it was really biased against Scientology. And hey, if Tom Cruise wants to jump on a couch and be happy, why is that? Why is that my problem? Like that's his business. Hold that thought. Hold that. Hold that thought. Right. Exactly. So. Um, this has been so amazing, so powerful. I'm in love with today and you guys in this interview. Um, so you guys became whistleblowers. I mean, I one, one really quick thing. It was mind boggling to watch the vow and to see that so much of the, the, the behaviors that you guys had to engage in to try and become whistleblowers in an effective way to take down you were able to film all that. So like you had a camera crew following you as you're strategizing, as you're brainstorming, and then as you're like taking him down. And that's that's a weird element because usually you don't have like an HBO backed film crew sort of chronicling your takedown of a high of a global high demand cult. Right. And keep in mind that HBO came got involved later. So, so was we, New York Times was your first? New York Times was yeah. the big first press. And then we did a lot of other press. Meanwhile, we were documenting for ourselves, just like with private camera people who know how to work oh, the camera. Yeah. yeah. So you hired you hired the camera crews originally hoping that someone well, would pick it up. It wasn't even that. We were documenting it to mostly for self preservation. Yeah. <laughs> no, we weren't. At the beginning, remember wow. the first time Mark sent Anthony to come okay. film us? It was like, we just got to get, like, just and document that's what's happening. He's a yeah. yeah. So Mark knew it, it wasn't that they were hiring, like, someone from the community, like, come over, film us. We got to give it, we got to tell people what's happening right now, like, get it on tape. Right. And then Jahan, who's one of the filmmakers who had taken our training, was like, we got to do something with this. And then it became more formal. And that, like, you know, there was a production company involved. Later, they sold the footage. January of 18, they took what footage they had. Collected for the last six months and sold the concept to, to HBO. HBO. Okay. So up and until that's then, when things cranked up. Okay. Yeah, that's when things cranked up. So then it was like uh, HBO's okay, filming. But for a while, it was just we were filming ourselves. Like that's we, even cooler. Yeah, I was filming <laughs> up um, with my cell phone. You know, we were. You that's, know. A, that's an act of faith. Like we, I, I come from a religious standpoint. <laughs> yeah, you guys had a lot of faith. You know what we did, and we've talked about this a lot in our podcast, is that we came from such a dark place, and all of a sudden there was so much support and light and good people that just popped out of the woodwork and held our hands and, and made and it. And I think that's because we put a lot of goodwill into the world with what we were doing previously under a dark regime that this was Karma. coming back. Mm. So, yeah. And it, I don't speak in those terms very often. <laughs> so mm-hmm. for me, I really, it, when it happens to you, it kind of it's kind of undeniable. Yeah. And I have to say, Mark, Mark and Bonnie are so lovable, yep. uh, and, and they come through in, in the vow. And there's, just, I'm sure, there's just so many people that have been an important part of this takedown. But I'm For just sure. at sure. that point in the vow when he escapes to Mexico, and then you guys are all wondering what's going to happen. Is he going to flee? It reminds me of Wild Wild Country. You know, when the <laughs> when. Go ahead. Oh, well, we were actually watching Wild Wild Country and there was this part where he was like being taken on a bus and like they call it diesel therapy where they like they drag the leader yeah. out and give him a hard time. That was literally happening to Keith at the same time as we were watching Wild Wild Country. Yeah. We were like, my, our lives are so yeah, crazy. I mean, how many people do you know in their 40s that have worked with the FBI and like taken down a criminal organization <laughs> yeah. and put a leader yeah. in jail for 120 yeah. years. Like it's a pretty, that's when you asked me last night, like, do you want to talk about other things? I'm like, it's kind of the most interesting thing in yeah. my life. I can talk about daycare and my green <laughs> juice habit and stuff like that, but it's not quite as interesting. And the good doctor. And the good doctor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're, you're like, are they going to get him? And they nab him. And when they nab him, I'm just like, it was like this euphoric moment. It's like, yeah. they got yes, him. They, they got, got him. him. Yeah. And you guys are crying. And on as the, far yeah. as I know, season two is more about the trial. You know, what happens once. So it, there's a season two. There is I a didn't season two coming that, yeah. in the yeah, first yeah, quarter, apparently. January. 2022. Yeah. 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 And there's more interviews with the inner circle. Apparently they interview Nancy and Lauren and more people from Mexico and more of the inner circle. Yeah. I don't, oh yeah, the people that are still loyal, but I don't know if they signed off on it or yeah, not. Yeah, they interviewed the, what we call the loyalists, also known as the flat earthers, because <laughs> they want to curate it. And they want to control the narrative, and look, none of their story holds up under like two or three questions, and they know that. And but sure. see, that's the weird parallel when I think about Joseph Smith is he ends up in prison, lynched, killed, all of it comes out in the papers. Fast forward 180 years, 
the most powerful global world religion and church in the United States for sure. More no no church in the United States has more power and money. And so and it and it, it was an almost identical founding. Yeah. And so like people people yeah. continue to believe. Beliefs are so resilient. And the worst thing you can do is make a martyr out of your founder. Yeah. Because then you just give fuel to the ongoing yeah. beliefs. And mm-hmm. I was just really quickly, like Gerardo, it turns out, I didn't learn this until I was watching The Vow, that he had a really strong presence in Mexico. Yeah. He was able mm-hmm. to get like sons of like former presidents of the company to get involved. And it was really starting to spread in Mexico. And it's already- It was in bigger in Mexico bec- than it was in the United States. Becoming a global movement, right? Yeah. yeah. And who knows if it's, it may, it may peter out. But it could continue because so many religions, do, yeah. Look, you know, <clears throat> look. without Keith calling the shots. Yeah, it's not and it's it, it's it's like eight to ten people maybe. that are, and I just don't. I mean, maybe, but but like, but yeah. like, um, founder of Scientology. Um, help me, people. I'm spacing. L. Ron L. Ron Hubbard died. And then there's David Miscavige. Joseph Smith dies. Then there's Brigham Young. It can't happen, is yeah. all I'm saying. <laughs> there's honestly, there's nobody that's loyal that I would trust could, that could do there's it. There's no one competent. Yeah, there's no one competent. The, the difference now is the internet. Yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah I think, for sure. Yeah. I, think. I mean, we had trouble recruiting even before this happened. People would go yeah. online. Because people and be Google like, them. They would Google them. Branding. What? I can't yeah. tell you yeah. how many people I lost that were going to do it. And, and then they, they went and online. They Googled it. And like, so it's probably the, 90%. So here's the biggest problem. We're going to end on this because you guys are here for Thrive. What's Thrive? It's literally just like, hey, ex-Mormons, you've been conditioned to believe you can't be happy and healthy and have a good family and raise good kids without a religion. That's what the church conditioned you to think and feel. Mm -hmm. And you've lost all your friends and family. So Thrive is literally just like, hey, you can find healing and joy after your religion. And there are people who can help you find healing and joy. Mm -hmm. And that's why we brought you guys. Okay, here's the rub. Because even if Nexium dies out, and even if Mormonism dies out, guess what? Our children, what what do you call, this is a joke, kind of a dark joke. What do you call the children of secular people who have left high demand religions? What do you call those children? Kara, do you know the do you know the, the punchline of the joke? Cult members and embryo? I don't know. Yeah. Fodder for the next cult. Right, right. right. Because even even if ding ding ding, you win a prize, Kara. You win, Thanks. you get an A today. Thank you. Because even if even if Nexium and the Mormon church implodes, the next Keith Renary or Joseph Smith is right around the corner. Right. And so how do we raise children that come to adulthood, get to college, become smart and enlightened and educated, that have the tools they need so they don't feel like they need to fill their hole inside with 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 some predatory cult members' teachings that are always self-improvement. It's not a cult, it's just self-improvement. And then... They don't see the signs, and then they get sucked right back in. And, and it, it, but it, it may not be a religion. It may be essential oils. It may be right. an MLM. It may be a yoga or a guru. It may be a bever- a, a special beverage. Like, there's a million cult opera. And I know this is kind of the direction you guys mm-hmm. hopefully want to go at some point. Mm-hmm. I'd, it's, a, it's more of a theoretical, rhetorical question, but that's what keeps me up at night now. Yeah, us too. We talk about all Anything the time. you want to say, and then we'll have you guys tell us all the things you're doing to help be a mine's, part of that. Mine's short. Yeah. Okay. Um, whatever impulse you have to join these things, it's normally because you're not feeling a certain way that you don't like. You're supposed to feel that way. Yeah. It's called growth. You're supposed to feel that way in your 20s. Yeah. You're supposed to maybe feel a little confused. That's part of it. Yeah. It's not a sign that you need. It's not, it's not, it's not a, a sign group. of anything... And for me, I had always had a schedule. I was playing sports. I didn't have to face that stuff until I was 24, 25. Mm-hmm. Right? Because you were performing. Because I was always, I was, well, I always had something yeah. that wasn't exposing that to me. And then I was like, okay, I'm 24, 25. I don't have skill sets. Go build them. That's what most people in their 20s are doing. You're building them. Yeah. It's normal. And then finding a community that's Welcome healthy. to the world. <laughs> healthy community without yeah. a leader. Like you don't need a leader, yeah. you know, doesn't, yeah. you don't need a guru. You've got your own inner guru. We just did a podcast called free your inner guru. Someone else's right. that we really liked. How do you, how do you nurture that in kids so that they feel like they can have the tools themselves or like read a book, but don't like take a workshop. You know, you don't have to, how do you make those decisions? I don't know. I don't have the answer. No, I, I said something, it. I said something in a <laughs> podcast yeah. that the guy liked and extracted and maybe it's applicable. Find someone who's doing what you want to be doing at the highest level and figure out what they did. Yeah. 
You don't have to follow them. You don't have them. to do that, but it, it'll open up another door that go, okay, what I'm doing is similar to them, but I like this avenue a little better. Yeah. You know, you and, and I actually, you don't have to join a group to do that. Though, I actually did that when I was 14 years old. I read a book about Bill Bradley, who was a senator of New Jersey and basketball player at Princeton. Became a senator, right? yeah. yeah. And I was like, I want to go play basketball at Princeton. That was my goal at 14, 15 years old, mm -hmm. right? I played all my sports and then I pursued that. And then it opened up other stuff in football and it ended up being something similar. Mm -hmm. So showing and people so, a path that's healthy and not, not dogmatic and, and open to question you know, and transparency, listen, like all, listen the opposite, to your parents. all the opposite things of a cult. <laughs> listen to your parents too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a book that we've covered in depth on Mormon stories called recovering agency, which is a book about identifying the tools of cults and high demand religions. They're Yanya. What's the Yanya Lalich, take what, back your life. Take back your <laughs> life. It's my personal Bible for healing. There's Stephen Hassan's books mm -hmm. about uh, cult awareness. Cult, mind control, freedom of mind. Yeah. And, but we need to become more literate about how to yeah. detect a high demand religion right out of college or, right. you know, when your career is sagging so that you can see those signs early and not tamp down your inner voice that's saying danger, danger, Will Robinson. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you can detect them and stay away. Yeah. yeah. That, I'm really right? passionate about teaching people that, Yeah, what the, what those red flags look like, how to acknowledge that intuitive signal and not override it because you're trying to like please someone or because you trust somebody, but like really listening to that instinct that we all had at some point, And then we overrode it for some mm. other reason, which was well-intentioned. It's not bad. It's normal. But the most, I think the most complex part of all of this is you said, don't join a group or whatever. The problem is we're tribal. Like it yeah. goes back that we need a tribe. And so like, as I'm, as I'm Healthy like group. trying to develop thrive, it's just like people are alone. Mm -hmm. They're lonely. Then I, we just held a retreat I'm thinking, oh man, I don't want to become Keith Raniere. We hold retreats right. and workshops, right? And all these people come and they need support. We ask them, what's the number one thing you miss or need? You know what they say? Community. Community. Yeah. yeah. You, so you, you know. So, so you can take the workshop and you can go to a retreat. You just can't make it your life. And, That's there, when and it there can't be consequences problem. to leaving. Yeah. you can, And you can come and go freely. There's no shame if you leave and- but you communities can, are hard to build. Yeah. They are hard and to build. And as soon as you start building a community, then you have rules and you have leaders. And yeah. then it, you always have to be like, as I'm watching The Vow, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, I, I never want to do that. I can see how that can happen. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can see how you can get popular. Yeah. I can see how people can start liking you. I can see how you can start wielding undue influence on your employees. Yeah. And I'm like, <clears throat> every step along the way, I'm like, wow, oh, that's a yeah. that's a pothole. Yeah. yeah and, you and, know, for me, a pothole for me in yeah, Mormon everything. stories and for Thrive, like every single I, step along the way. Everything too. throughout history too, like the constitution had checks and balances in it. They understood that to yeah. a certain degree. Checks and right? balances. And, and so they have things that four years here and then you're out and then, or, or eight. Term limits. Eight, term yep. limits yep. and all that stuff. So, I, you know. A balance of powers, a separation yeah. of powers, yeah. right? So I'm part of the, similar to you with your, with Thrive, I'm part of hashtag I got out, which yeah. is a mixture of experts and survivors and whistleblowers. And we're trying to expose the shame and help people tell their stories so that we change the stigma and all that. But even still, there's a group of people and there's dynamics. Yeah. We all come yeah. from cults yeah. Yeah. and we're laughing about like, here we are. <laughs> like, I've, how I've do we do? Overheard some of the meanings and I've been like, oop. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but we're but we're aware enough to go. Okay, we yeah, gotta yeah. get this. No, it's not. Yeah. Uh, but it, but it's, we're human. We're all we got, human doing yeah, our thing. We gotta figure it out. Yeah. Well, the book is Scarred by Sarah Edmondson. It's an amazing book. I have not finished it, but I will. Mm -hmm. uh, the movie, the documentary, is The Vow on HBO. Nine part series for season one. Season two coming in 2022. Tell us about your amazing podcast and everything else you want to plug uh, to our audience. Sure. Cause these are rhetorical questions. We've yeah. got to figure this out yeah, we gotta and figure let's it do out. it together. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. That, that is largely what a little bit culty is. We talked to the survivors. That's your podcast, right? Yeah. Well, it's a little bit culty. So we're, we're <laughs> looking, we're looking at things that are just a little bit and then full on cults. And we mostly talk to whistleblowers, survivors, experts, often they're experts that are used to be survivors. So almost everyone comes from a cult or researchers on cults. And uh, we just have really wonderful conversations and we try to really come up with the red flags that are yeah. the template for people so they don't join in the first place or they can get out if they're in it or they can heal if they're already out. And the precursors to things that if you're confused on it, mm -hmm. these might give you a language to where the abuses that you couldn't articulate before might be or not. 
Yeah. yeah. Instead of saying, oh, it's a little bit culty. Well, specifically it's culty because it's insular or because there's one person at the top, then no one's holding him accountable. Or you can't speak of what's happening inside of their secrecy, like very specific things of what makes it just a little bit culty or fully culty. So yeah. giving people those terms, I think has been really helpful and it's helpful for us. Like we're, we're still figuring out. Yeah, we have great out. conversations with interesting people. And we're we actually know. having the conversations that we were, thought we were having. Yeah, because like <laughs> Nippy and I are the same people. We joined Nexium because yeah. we wanted to grow and we wanted to help other people. And now we get to actually help other people. Right. It's very rewarding. And finding, in a, finding an arena to do it in was, you know, one of the things that lured me in DSP as well. I thought of law, I thought of other things. And they just didn't feel like those were the avenues and this presented itself and this seemed like an avenue to go in and I chose poorly. <laughs> but look where we're at now. It, look at the conversations it, we it, get to have. Like we were To in my Salt point, Lake City. earlier I found something that I felt like was, was right and then it pivoted me here and I think if you're on that journey, you're going to find it eventually. You probably we can't answer the question of whether you are looking back, wish it had never happened, or like are so grateful for the growth that uh, you are are at peace. I'm at peace. Really? Um, yeah. I wouldn't, wouldn't change, change anything. anything. Really? <laughs> James, oh! I wouldn't. Not alcoholic beer. <laughs> I wouldn't. You really wouldn't <laughs> after all that. I mean, like you can't live in that way. Like obviously, with faced with certain decisions, I wish I had made it certain. Like I, you know, it would have been great. And I always wonder sometimes what would have happened yeah. if I'd pursued acting and not Nexium and can't live that way. Yeah. I have to, you can't because you, then you're just stuck in well, suffering also, and regrets. we're still alive and we're still have a lot of our lives ahead of us. I wouldn't so. have met him. I would have had yeah. my two beautiful boys who I love, you know, with all of my heart. I, I yeah. love our lives now. It's full of meaning. It's full of purpose is what, what I was looking for in the beginning. So yeah. can I just ask though, full circle? what do you think when you are getting out of the shower and you do see the branding on your hip? Oh, I had it removed. You did have it removed. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. it's not like a trigger that you have to look at nope. and nope. remind yourself nope. of. I had okay. plastic surgery oh that was God. actually paid for by a philanthropist who heard about the story. And uh, this has helped this. some of the other women get theirs removed as well. That's incredible. Now it's just a thin, I can show you later, maybe not on camera, <laughs> but it's a white thin line that's smaller than a C-section. Okay. Yeah, it's almost gone. Cause like I can smother really? it. So you don't oh. have to have like an emotional no, like, no, reaction I, every time you see I it. I had it very, very faded after two and a half years of creams and lotions and exfoliating. And, and I had got it down to a very thin white line, but I could still see KR hmm. in the mirror. And I saw a plastic surgeon. She was like, if you really want this off your body, which I think you do, then we just got to cut it out. So they literally like it's, it was this big and they cut a shape like this around it, cut it out and then sealed it back up. Oh, so, it's just yeah. gone. Like they literally cut the skin. My append wow. appendectomy scar is probably worse. Yeah. Well, I love that. Look, I told you the universe greeted us and took yeah. care of us in many more ways than we could have anticipated and even thought we needed. And to answer your question, Kara, before I had it removed, it fueled me to fight. It wasn't a trigger of what had happened to me. It was a trigger about why I needed to speak up about it. That's a great reframe. Yeah. That's love great. that reframe. Yeah. I told so. her, try the initials are Keith Richards, not Keith. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't work. I'm a Stones fan. I get that reference, but that's because yeah. I'm old. <laughs> Keith who? Keith Richards. Well, uh, I mean, it's a reframe, but it's also really good mental health to yeah. say, if you've been through something hard, how are you going to turn it into something where you're benefiting the lives of other people? And that's that is why you guys uh, are so inspiring to me because you've taken difficult things and pain and now you're turning around and trying to bless other people's lives. Turning a negative into a because positive. Because I read something to you. And thing. then also what is extra special to me, and I think Sarah, Kara and Gerardo and Margie are going to agree with this because they're all here in studio, is that you are willing to come bless our people because sometimes you can't see it in your own organization, mm -hmm. but if somebody else sure. from a different organization mm -hmm. comes to you and takes the time, you guys could have not come you could have probably made a lot of money doing other things you came at a discount but and, and, and you you have a lot of other things you can do with your time you came to utah to help bless our people mm -hmm. and you blessed us with things we can't provide ourselves which is an outside perspective to view and to learn mm -hmm. from to actually ironically see ourselves better mm -hmm. you've done that you're not just helping your own nexium survivors you're helping us and, and many other groups I as well. So. And I can't, and, and Kara, I, I think so Kara's well nodding. Said, right. And uh, we can't thank you enough for doing what we can't do ourselves. Isn't I that what the, that. both groups profess to do in the first place? 
Now we can actually do right? it. Yeah. Somebody so, sent me this meme. I want to read it to you real quick. I love it. This is how we'll end on this. When we recovered loudly. Oh, God, now it's gone. Hold on a second. No problem. Did it. Take two. When we recovered loudly, we keep others from dying quietly. So this is the uh, Recovered Loudly podcast, if you wouldn't need when a title. We, I'm, I, got, I just got a tingle. I just felt the Holy <laughs> Ghost. Uh, is, that, is that a revelation? Yep. Yeah. When we recover loudly, we keep others from dying, dying quietly. quietly. If you, Kara's doing the air snaps. I do the air snaps. If you need a title for this podcast, it could be called Recovering Loudly with Sarah and Nippy. <laughs> That's your next book. Oh, yes. It's like how to, because I've never heard that before. Yes. And you can cite it. And it's like, you can be the next Glennon Doyle or better. I said you know? I wasn't going to write another book. It was so stressful. But um, yes! in, 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 in preparation, hear Mormon stories. If, if, if it, <laughs> it, preparing for this weekend and for the speech tomorrow, I was like, I have learned a lot. If I could like package yes. it into something that like people could take, because I'm like yes. pulled from all these different things and I could. Getting yeah, out maybe. is just step one. Yeah. It's healing mm -hmm. and growing. Yeah. That's the whole point is the healing and growth. Getting a new community, educating, self-love, self-care. All right. Reclaiming your time and your values. Green learning juice. to deal with emotions. Finding healthy practices. Stay tuned for the next episode of Mormon <laughs> Stories with Sarah and Nippy. Come back in about a year. Year two. Get a promote we'll have you guys book. back. Oh, oh, oh. Right. We'll oh help you gosh. promote your book. Because uh, it was born here. Us. It was born here. <laughs> All right. Mormon we stories. love you guys. Support. Uh, how can people give you money or support you? Um... By buying the book is great. Okay. Um, I also narrated the Audible. If you want to hear me uh, speaking it, mm -hmm. I'm going mm -hmm. to listen a little bit culty. Listen to a little bit culty. Follow tell us on Instagram. I'm tell on Instagram. Fr tell my friend. Tell your friends. Tell your friends to follow us. Sarah Edm Edmondson, Anthony Ames, a little bit culty. On, all on Instagram. We are working on setting up a foundation for survivors and not just of Nexium, but that's in the works. Yeah. So love it. Stand, stand by. Okay. Yeah. All right, everyone, thanks so much for tuning in. If you value this content, please become a supporter of Mormon Stories at mormonstories.org. You can become a monthly donor. Hope you enjoyed Thrive. This is after Thrive. We'll keep doing Thrive as long as it's helpful. But let's all be good to each other no matter what and learn the critical thinking skills and the uh, coercive techniques of high demand religions and cults so that you don't leave one cult to join another. That's the lesson for today. <laughs> Sarah Nippy, we love you guys. Let's yeah. go see a jazz game. Let's Wait, do it. All right? All right. And let's go do Thrive. Okay. Kara, it's so awesome to have you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, you this is amazing to hear. Yeah. I, when I have those headphones on and I was like, this is the most intense thing I've ever heard come through these headphones. Really? So I hope everyone listening to the podcast feels the same way too. Good. So yeah, thank you guys for sharing. That was an incredible story. I'm sure it was kind of summarized really densely, but yeah, That's I hope people- true. I hope people enjoyed that as much as I did. That and Gerardo cool. and Margie off camera, we love you guys, and we're glad you're here, and you guys make what we do possible. So yeah. love you guys. Love to you guys. Thanks too. so much. All right, take care, everybody. See you guys Thank soon you. on Mormon Stories. Bye. Peace.